19th episode of Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality. And of course, today we are going to be talking about the policy of Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality. It only took 19 episodes and how many hours to finally get to this point. Russia, the, the agony of imperial Russia, the causes and consequences of the Crimean War. I am very lucky to be joined by Columba. Hello. Hello, good to be here. I've survived the event <laughs> miraculously. <laughs> Hitman returning after last week's conversation. Hello. And of course, Marcus Furious Bethnax. Indeed, and good morning, everyone. Good it's good on you for doing two of these in a row, by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, no, all good. Thank you very much. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before I get onto the main thrust of today's topic, which is I'm afraid for the foreseeable future there will be no lectures delivered by me. My voice isn't recovering, and uh, indeed I, I need a little bit of a rest occasionally to allow someone else to speak. So there will be no solo content until I'm completely recovered on the voice front, I'm afraid. Now getting on to today's conversation, the Crimean War. I'm sure people who have a passing familiarity with the Crimean War will know it for two things, Florence Nightingale on the one side and the charge of the Light Brigade on the other, though perhaps without the context of, as to understanding why that happened. And of course, you'll probably know about Mary Seacole, <laughs> uh, to bring in another more recent sort of uh, point of investigation into the Crimean War. But I'm not really interested in any of these things, albeit Columba will be talking about aspects of the charge of the Light Brigade later on. What I'm interested in is focusing on this idea of imperial Russia's agony during the 19th century, because I believe that the Crimean War is the central turning point of the 19th century, and it represents the great check to Russian expansion over a 200 year history. When you look at the scale and the sort of the rise of the Romanovs, the Romanovs start from a very poor position during the time of troubles and the occupation of Moscow by the Polish Lithuanian armies. And over the course of two centuries, the Romanovs are able to transform Russia into Europe's foremost continental imperial power. And they do this despite the Great Northern War in which Russia is ravaged by the forces of Sweden's Charles XII, and indeed, after Napoleon defeats the Russians, the Battle of Austerlitz, the Battle of Friedland, the Battle of Borodino, and takes the city of Moscow in 1812. Despite all of these temporary setbacks, Russia is able to recover from these defeats and is able to win total victory in the case of Sweden and total victory in the case of Russia. The Ottoman Empire up until this point is no different. Russian and the Ottoman relations have always been strained right from the beginning. However, from the latter part of the 17th century, the Russians have taken the town of Azov, gaining access to the Black Sea, and progressively, especially during the reign of Catherine the Great, the Russians take control of what is now eastern modern Ukraine, southern Ukraine, and finally they take over Crimea. And during the reign of Alexander I, the Russians begin to push into the Caucasus, and they also take the region of Bessarabia as well in modern day Moldova. So up until now, Russia has not faced a severe military check. And in this sense, the Crimean War represents, I would argue, one of the most calamitous defeats of the Russian Empire, which presages the defeats of Russia, which she will face in the Russo-Japanese War at the beginning of the 20th century, and indeed the calamity, which is Russia's performance in the First World War. However, I also want to use this opportunity to focus on Nicholas I and the incredibly bad press he has received in uh, all sort of aspects of historiography. Because what is remarkable about Nicholas I and the precipitation of the Crimean War is that Russia is almost universally characterized as expansionist, when in reality, Russia was, I would say, during the reign of Nicholas I, perhaps the most isolationist it had been compared to, say, for example, with the reign of Alexander III later in the 20th century. He's also known, uh, later in the 19th century rather, he is also known for his reactionary foreign policy. But again, I would argue that this was a response to the Decemberist revolt. This was a, re a response to the July revolution in 1830 in France, the Belgian revolution that followed, and indeed the cadets revolution in Poland, which happens in the same year. And even just to emphasize how demeaned Nicholas is in historiography. I'm not sure how many of you watch Star Trek to bring this conversation down, but Nicholas I is responsible for the creation of the third section of the Imperial Chancellery. And of course, people who are familiar with Star Trek will know of section 31, which is obviously based on Nicholas's creation of the third section of the Imperial Chancellery, just by adding one to it, which is seen as a prototype to the Okrana and of course the Cheka 
NKVD, KGB, mm. Gestapo, all of these nefarious um, secret police organizations focusing on the apprehension of political prisoners, despite the fact that the organization was virtually tiny, had very few members and very little reach. So we're talking about after what you can consider the schizophrenic reign of Alexander, both in foreign policy and in domestic foreign policy, uh, domestic policy, um, Nicholas I represents an attempt to try and naturalize Russia's ideological position vis-a-vis -vis the West. And it opts for the aforementioned orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. And I have a section by Andrew Zorin, which I'm going to be reading later. And so when we get to the Crimean War, and we talk about the Eastern question, and we talk about the idea of Russian expansionism, we also need to contextualize that Russia is consolidating around a definitively conservative direction, which only incorporates elements of the West which do not damage this overall sense of Russian national identity or impugn the idea of autocracy mm. and Russia's distinctly orthodox character. So when this is opposed by the forces of neo-Bonapartism in the form of Napoleon III and the Whig, later liberal administration of Aberdeen and Palmerston, this takes on an ideological character as well as being one of the most definitive conflicts of the Cold War of the 19th century, which is the great game. I would also contend that this is the dissolution of the concert of Europe, the failure, definitive failure of Metternich's order. And the Crimean War inaugurates a period of European expansionism and a recontextualization of Russia's own imperial mission from both within Russia, but also in terms of the knock-on effect, in terms of facilitating Italian unification and German unification as well. So in all of these respects, not just for Russian history, British history, French history, even Piedmontese history, if we're talking about the combatants, Turkish history, this is a fundamentally world-shattering event that needs to be understood and appreciated in the full scale of its implications. And of course, I'm sure some of you will be able to draw some comparison analogy between this conflict and what is going on at the moment. Uh, before I sort of get onto the chronology, is there any point you want to raise after my very long introduction? Anyone? Well, well, I mean, um, you know, you talk about this idea of, um, you know, the Russians having this reputation as being expansionist. Um, and, you know, I don't have the expertise, but certainly in the case of the Crimean War and what we're going to be looking at here, um, this seems to be a, a very much a case of um, a cynical um, moves, on, especially on the part of the, uh, the French, you know, Napoleon III, to sort of try mm. and um, buoy up his own support. And the Russians seem to really be um, on the receiving end and, and not you yes. know, making any sort of initiative here. So, yeah. And just to contextualize this, Towards the end of the reign of Alexander I, Alexander I takes such a conservative turn in his foreign policy that he reneges on the idea that Russia is the protector of the Eastern Orthodox community when given the strongest possible pretext to intervene, using that as a casus belli, which is during the Greek War of Independence and the so-called ethnomartyrs, Gregory V, the patriarch, uh, patriarch of Constantinople, etc. Uh, not just in terms of attacking the Greek community, but in attacking the Orthodox community within Russia itself. This is in stark contrast to what we see earlier in Russia's history, which is the Greek plan of Catherine the Great, Catherine's explicitly hostile actions towards the Ottomans in the Black Sea, and her desire to create a new Greco sort of Byzantine state with her second grandson, Constantine, uh, Constantine Pavlovich, who would later go on to rule as viceroy in Poland as the ruler of a new restored Byzantine empire. If you compare this to the later foreign policy of Alexander I after the concert of Vienna, a Congress of Vienna, and to the foreign policy of Nicholas himself, who again, it should be noted in terms of the consistency of his foreign policy, that he only has one foreign minister throughout the entire duration of his 30 year reign, which is Karl Nessel Road, is incredibly conservative and cautious in comparison with the sort of world shattering aspirations, ambitions of their great grandmother, Catherine the Great. Why exactly? Um... Um, did the Russians become sort of disinterested in the uh, in the Greek situation? What caused that sort of shift in policy? Well, as we discussed um, last time, it was Alexander's turn to recognizing the sort of fundamental preservation of European monarchy. 
above that of the individual sort of expansion of various nations. And this was something which the Greeks didn't fully appreciate and understand. In fact, Cabadistrius, who was the Russian foreign minister then, who was, again, Greek, um, was told specifically by Alexander to disown Epsilantis when he crossed over the proof and attempted to unite the Danubian principalities and in their insurrection against the Ottoman Empire with Russian support. When Russia does intervene, which is getting on to the reign of Alex, the reign of Nicholas I, Alexander dies in 1825, and Nicholas becomes Tsar um, after a brief interregnum and the Decemberist uprising, which again is, reflects the radicalization of the of the uh, Russian officer corps during this period. And when you look at the early foreign policy of Nicholas I, he is very much responding in a very limited way to, you can say, the political situation that has already developed. I don't see Russia during the Greek War of Independence as a primary instigator. Very much I see it as a reactive power, and that's something we were trying to get mm. to. I mean, when we look at great power intervention, uh, Britain was the leading power in terms of the interventionist party, first of all through resources and loans by George Canning, and then direct military intervention. And of course, the most decisive aspect of the foreign intervention was the destruction of the Egyptian Ottoman navy at the Battle of Navarino, um, which I believe also kicked off the Eastern question. And it's only after the decisive intervention of the British and later the French do the Russians come in, and we have the Ottoman War, of 1827-1829. And if you look at this map, because it's a very short war, it only concludes after two years, I view this as very much the mopping up of what had already occurred during this time, because we have the great sort of thrust forward in the later reign of Catherine the Great. And during the reign of Alexander I, I mean, we already talk about uh, Paul and his desire to attack um, India through Persia. But just look at this map. Already during the reign of Alexander I, Georgia, which had been sort of an independent confederation of several kingdoms, had been annexed or placed under the protector, um, protect, under Russian protectorates. And so when Russia is at war with both Qajari Iran and the Ottoman Empire, really this is a consolidation of what had already been gained in the previous conflicts during the reign of Alexander. And this is what I mean by Nicholas being fundamentally conservative and isolationist in comparison, because given the appalling state of affairs in the Ottoman Empire at that time, and how they're facing a three power, great power intervention, would you say that these Russian gains, say for example, in the uh, Dobruzhda in the west, south of Bessarabia, the mouth of the Danube, and the expansion into Batumi in uh, Georgia, would you say that these gains are rather conservative conservative given the situation in the Ottoman Empire at that time? Well, yes, I mean, the, the Ottoman situation is absolutely powerless, isn't it? I mean, they're sort of facing um, um, a constant struggle from every direction. So it's very surprising that the Russians wouldn't be um, more expansionist. But I mean, one thing that I would speak, say um, more generally about this point of Russian expansion, it's something that I um, that I read, and it was this idea that um, in the wake of the, um, um, the Crimean War in general, the Russian focus sort of um, um, shifted and you had more sort of um, expansion to the Far East and sort of, um, 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 you know, the, the great game and all of this as a result. Uh, what, what do you sort of make of that idea of a sort of pivot of Russian expansionism? Well, that I, I completely agree with you. And this is where the conversation is hopefully going to get to when we get to towards the end of the Crimean War and where we talk about Russia's expansionist turn and how the Crimean War intensifies the great game rather than de-escalating it. But yes, you're completely right. Russia becomes more imperialist after this. And my fundamental reasoning as to why that is, is because Nicholas, in continuation with the later reign of Alexander I, is acting within the mind, acting within the mindset of the concert of Europe. He only thinks, he's thinking of expansion in terms of consensus making. And so when we look at the expansionism of Alexander II, it is very much in the context of the great game, i.e. explicitly hostile towards Britain and trying to expand into areas where Britain has a vested interest, whereas Nicholas I isn't so bellicose. And even in the way that he is bellicose in response to uh, French expansion into the Ottoman Empire, you can say the French demands for compensation after their uh, humiliation, after supporting the wrong side in the Egyptian Ottoman wars. Um, they, Again, this is a remarkable about turn. Um, just getting to the first of years, we've illustrated the Persian War, we've illustrated the Ottoman War as a form of consolidation of the Caucasus region. Um, there are two other major conflicts to consider. Nicholas I, um, sorry, hello, Nick, man. 
Oh, yep. Yeah, so if I could just add in something quickly, um, can we quickly just go back to the other map? Yep. Um, yes, because um, yes, in regards to consolidation, well, one thing I noticed is that um, essentially with those gains, it's more defensible frontiers. So in case of a future war, it's easier to preserve what, what's been taken, essentially. Yes, this is this is imperial consolidation, absolutely, Hitman. If you look at the borders of the Danube again, this is preventing the Ottomans from having a further outpost which to strike into Bessarabia. At the same time, this is pushing, this is consolidating the Caucasus boundaries to better defend against both Iran and the Ottoman Empire at the same time. Uh, albeit these little areas we see in Dagestan and Circassia, say for example, are going to be part of this greater sort of renovation and consolidation that we see during the reign of um, Alexander II. Indeed, I very much actually wanted a semagogue to come on, but unfortunately he couldn't make it to talk about the uh, genocide of the Circassians, which occurs during the 1860s. So yes, absolutely, just um, in terms of thinking of this as imperial consolidation, and also thinking about this in terms of the broader balance of power in Europe. So this is the situation in 1848, but I'm going to go a little bit further to 1830. Uh, Nicholas I is renowned as being the gendarme of Europe, essentially the policeman of Europe. And he's renowned for this because of his intervention in Hungary in 1849, 1848, 1849. But when we think of the just sort of general pattern of revolutions, the concept of Europe system begins to fall apart very quickly. From I mentioned in the a previous lecture that from 1822, Britain begins supporting tacitly um, elements of, say, for example, the liberal movements in Spain and the New World. However, from 1830, we see a definitive breach in the new concept of Europe, which is the July Revolution, which deposes Charles X of France, and he's replaced by uh, Louis Orléans. Uh, this enrages Nicholas to such an extent that he wants to intervene to depose Louis Philippe and restore Charles' attempt to the throne. All the more so, in fact, he refers to Louis Philippe as the usurper throughout the remainder of his reign. And of course, as a consequence of the July Revolution, we also see the revolution in Belgium. But perhaps what is equally as significant as the change of the guard in France and the failure of the Bourbon Restoration and the creation of a new Belgian state out of the former United uh, Provinces under, under the mm. Netherlands is that we see a far more bellicose and you could almost say a proto-neocon administration in Great Britain under their foreign minister Lord Palmerston. For Lord Palmerston, who has often been characterized as a conservative domestically and a liberal abroad, and I would say a revolutionary abroad, this turn of affairs in France is actually positive because France is being brought out of the Austrian remit, more legitimist, and instead it is adopting a style of constitutional government with Louis himself styling himself as le roi citoyen, the citizen king. And given the fact that the Whig party in Britain, which will later become the Liberal Party, is wanting to consolidate its own iteration of constitutional monarchy, you can almost say that the revolution in France actually helps give the impetus for the 1832 Great Reform Act, that this is a welcome development in London. And indeed, it is the pact between Britain and a more liberal France. And later this will be renewed when Napoleon uh, the Third comes to power in 1848 and affects his self-coup in 1851, that these two powers will begin to represent a hostile interest towards these supposedly reactionary powers in the rest of Europe, whether it be Prussia, Austria, and of course, pivotally, Russia. And this is where Nicholas I wants to assume that position, which Metternich would want to assume, which is the idea of a European coalition to intervene and put down these, um, again, cracks in the post-Napoleonic world order. However, because he's operating under the system of the concept of Europe, such intervention can't be unilateral. It has to be multilateral in the sense that Austria and Prussia have to go along with it. And in the ensuing time, in order to bring about a European coalition against France and Belgium, Britain has already signaled that it supports the revolution, making it virtually impossible to invade France without yeah. having a similar I mean, Britain, support from Britain. I mean, Britain had always, always had sort of, um, <laughs> separate um, separate sort of goals for the concert and a sort of a separate conception from the more sort of uh, conservative powers in, in the east of Europe, right? And this is why I believe that Castlereagh, when, you know, he committed suicide. In, uh, yeah, it was such it, a blow. Well, it was such a blow in terms of the effectiveness of the concept of Europe, because Britain, first of all, became disengaged 
under the duration of Lord Liverpool's administration in Britain. But with Lord Palmerston, it became actively hostile, therefore supporting this breach within the old international order. But what also really stymies any military effectiveness, had Nicholas I wanted to intervene on his own, is the revolution that spins off again from Belgium, from France, which is the December Revolution in sorry november and december revolution in poland um i love this uh, image on the right here this painting mm. by cossack because it uh, displays the russian cuirassiers fighting the guards of the polish army under a statue of uh, jan sobieski the great polish king who defeated the turks at the battle of vienna what is fascinating about Poland during this time from 1815 until 1830 is that it is technically a constitutional monarchy with the Tsar as ruling in a personal union, not a province of Russia. This was a compromise that was meted out by the Congress of Vienna to allow for the Russians to assume control over what was a tiny part of Poland and would later become the Vistula provinces under Alexander I. As a result of this, Poland actually had its own separate army. And over the course of the vice royality of Nicholas's older brother, Constantine, who had rejected the throne during the interregnum, many of the Polish officers, like the Decembrists who tried to overthrow Nicholas in the succession in 1825, had become radicalized. And indeed, they're expecting French support due to that Napoleonic association, and indeed pre-Napoleonic association with the Bar Confederation between France and Poland. And yeah. so what we see here is not just a national uprising of Poland, but it is a mutiny of the Polish army, which hasn't been disbanded yet. And so what the 1830 sort of revolution, 1831 revolution, actually takes the characteristics of a war between Poland and Russia rather than a simple insurrection. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. There has always been that um, that that, uh, that link between a sort of Polish independence and French support, especially during the sort of revolutionary period, right? That's why you had um, such fervent support um, and a lot of Polish troops under Napoleon is because they were sort of angling for their independence. They were tired of sort of being, uh, you know, ceaselessly chopped up between the Germans and the Russians. Indeed, and I think it's impossible. I mean, look, look, the tensions were already simmering, but it's impossible to imagine the Polish Revolution happening had it not been for the French Revolution and the Belgian Revolution in the same year. The effect of this is that the Russians win definitively, and the Polish constitutional settlement is disbanded and instead replaced with the organic statute, which for all intents and purposes makes Congress Poland a part of Russia, and this will be increased further in terms of further limiting of autonomy later on in 1863, where there is another broader uprising of both Poland and Lithuania. So Nicholas I is having to deal with the after effects of the 1830 revolution. And this combined with the fact that there is a cholera epidemic in the army and leads to the cholera um, riots in 1831, means that even if Nicholas wanted to, he doesn't have the effective power to forestall and turn the tide against these revolutionary forces in the west of Europe. So you can say that he had every intention of assuming this position of the policeman of Europe at the beginning of his reign, as he did at the, at, in, at the later part of his reign. However, it was checked by the practical implications and indeed the muted response from Prussia and Austria. Indeed, in December of 1830, Russia has no choice essentially other than to confirm and ratify what had happened and try to uh, make amends with the idea of France as being Orleanist and Belgium as being independent. Um, I, I just wanted to say, by the way, because um, um, I know you're, I know um, with your throat you've been feeling a bit ill, but um, um, for the sort of the beginning of the war proper, I have this sort of um, interesting introductory passage um, from Fisher, which I think might be fun to read because I'd really like to get your impression on sort of um, what uh, he which, says. Which war is this? Uh, the Crimean War. Can I can I just hold hold that for a moment because um I have a couple more sections to get to before we get to the Crimea War. Sorry, I'm going about a very roundabout way, but I believe this is all necessary in terms of building the context as to why this happens, because now this reflects into Nicholas's own policy towards the Ottomans. On the one hand, it has been demonstrated that the Ottomans had, again, the Russians had intervened and enabled in part Greek independence, albeit very half-heartedly, very tacitly, and only on the back of a general great power intervention after Russia had denied taking that decisive moment back in 1822 when Ypsilantis crossed the proof. After this new state of affairs in 1829, there is 
you could say, the consequence of the Greek War of Independence. The Egyptians had been brought in to service the Ottomans on the condition that they would receive territorial compensation. Because the Ottomans have lost, there is no territorial compensation. And Mustafa Ali Pasha, Bekhmet Ali, invades Syria. And this is interesting because, again, if you look at uh, the policy of Nicholas I as aimed towards the destruction of the Ottoman Empire and fundamentally expansionist, this doesn't make any sense because the Russians decisively intervene on the side of the Ottomans to prevent Mehmed Ali taking over Constantinople. And the reason why this is, is because due to the Treaty of Kuchuk Kalyanaka, which is the result of the first great war with Catherine the Great and the Ottoman Empire, the Russians have a constitutionally invested interest in maintaining their position as the protector of the Orthodox Christians. Whereas had Mehmet Ali installed himself effectively as the new Sultan of, you know, Sultan of the Ali dynasty um, in replacing the Ottoman Empire, then there is no constitutional arrangement. There is no diplomatic yeah. understanding between Russia and the Egyptians. I so mean, Russia... Not only not not only that right but the current dynasty the osmanlis they were sort of i mean you know quite quite a weak central power who are being Absolutely. torn at by all of these different um governors whereas if you have ali come in from egypt i mean then then he would be the sultan um operating from constantinople but he would also have a very very strong base of power in egypt and so you could like it would likely be you know a resurgent um ottoman empire right so you can understand why the russians really wouldn't want that Exactly. What we're seeing at the beginning of the Eastern question is the Russians preserving the Ottoman Empire against the Egyptians, which again yeah. muddies our view in terms of looking at Russia as fundamentally the aggressor in this picture. And uh, is, it, is it here because, I mean, I think there's a sort of a brief break, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and then Ali attacks again. And don't, don't the British and the French get involved as well, um, attacking Egypt um, f um, with navies? Or... Yes, I'm sorry to keep doing this to you, uh, Columba. I'll, I'll just get through this, this domestic section first, because I, I really want to illustrate why, uh, what is actually Russia did in terms of trying to create an ideological opposition to the West. Um, I did send it to you actually, which is the um, Andrei Zorin chapter on orthodoxy, autocracy, mm. nationality by Fables Alone. I have an abridged version of this, but this is a very concise appreciation of what exactly um, Uvarov was trying to achieve in positioning um, Russia's own conception of itself, Russia's own imperial ideology in the aftermath of what I refer to as the schizophrenic policies of Alexander I, and indeed the general aftermath, the turn towards Russian nationalism and the building hostility towards liberalism, especially for um, uh, Nicholas himself after the Decemberist revolt and the Polish revolt. So if it's all right with everyone, I'm going to read this section. And as usual, if you want to input if you want to uh, say anything then uh, please stop me and uh, please do so. Sure. A new phase of ideological production began in the early 1830s which was a turning point in the Russian Empire's foreign and domestic policies. The peace of Adrianople with Turkey in 1829 which ended that war had put an end at least for some time to Russia striving for dominance over the Orthodox East and the unification of peoples of the faith under its aegis. The new emperor, Nikolai Pavlovich, henceforth referred to as Nicholas I, fully shared his elder brother, Alexander, scepticism towards the grandiose notions of their grandmother, i.e. the Greek plan. However educated Russian society still cherished the dream of Russia's historic destiny of restoring Greece, and therefore had been disillusioned by the lack of mention of Greece and the Orthodox faith in the imperial fast manifesto that had declared war. Again, this is iterating the incredibly limited goals of Nicholas in that war and how it really was a matter of consolidating the borders as opposed to fundamentally altering the position of the Ottoman Empire vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Now, if the Slavic question remained on the agenda, it had been shifted from the realm of politics into, the, into that of hypothetical schemes, while the Greek question was taken off the table completely. This was even more the case after the assassination of John Capodistrius, the first president of Greece and former secretary of state for Russian for foreign affairs. So really what happens after the assassination of John Capodistrius, and you could say Greece is again, domination by the tripartite power system, is that Greece having started off with this grandiose notion of having been this restored sort of military room, uh, the nation of Rome under a Hellenic Republic has only really become a peripheral consideration for Russia because the Ottoman Empire by and large still exists with this Peloponnese truncated iteration of Hellas, which exists in the South. 
Having rejected expansionist plans in the East, the Russian autocracy also adopted a more cautious policy in the West. The path was more likely intended to curtail the, influ the influx of foreign influences into Russia than to aggressively pursue its own agenda beyond Russia's borders. When he received word of the revolutions in France and Belgium, Nicholas I considered the possibility of military intervention in Europe, but the Polish uprising forced him to completely reject such an idea and to preserve the status quo. Thus, the section of the Holy Alliance's legacy that was based on the collective armed defense of existing monarchical regimes was at least temporarily ideological repudiated. The moderate isolationism that came to the fore in Nicholas's foreign policy, however, was by no means connected to a focus on long-awaited internal reforms. On the contrary, under the impact of the same complex of historical events, the July Revolution in France, the Polish Revolt, the cholera riots of the summer of 1831, the emperor discarded the reformist plans of the first five years of his reign, in which he had revived Russia with war, hopes and labours. Even the highly modest recommendations of the December the 6th Commission, which were the culmination of these efforts, were, as it turned out, essentially shelved. The rejection of reforms did not mean that the emperor no longer believed in their necessity. In the early 1830s, Nikolaevan politics took on its classical form, whose essence the autocrat expressed aphoristically at 1842, while putting the brakes on yet another project for gradual reform, he declared, There is no doubt that serfdom in its present situation is evil, the most palatable and obvious to everyone, but to touch on it now would be even more a ruinous, affair, a ruinous matter. And again, this is consistent with his brother's policy in the sense that he was cautious to recontextualize the policy of serfdom in one province in the empire in Livonia and this transition, the slow transition across the provinces from serfdom to that of the laneship, i.e. a sort of more uh, benign iteration of serfdom. Mm. Was this, this, um, uh, would you say that the, the view about um, serfdom was sort of genuinely held, um, you know, their views on it being an evil, or do you think this was a, a bit more cynical? Uh, this is consistent with both Alexander and Nicholas I's own sort of, you can say, Christian understanding. H however, there is an element of cynicism in it. I mean, I do not look on Alexander II as the Tsar liberator. I believe that the emancipation of serfdom was made possible only by the degeneracy and the useless utility that the aristocracy provided to the Russian, uh, Russian monarchy. If you mm. look at the 19th century, serfdom was an effective tool in bringing the aristocracy to the side of the Tsar, or indeed Tsarina in the case of Catherine, um, to ensure that they would act in the style of a service nobility, even adopting elements of the table of ranks and Catherine again confirmed this by his bestowing upon them more and more privileges. But by, in the aftermath of the Crimean War, uh, definitely the opinion of Alexander II is that these reforms were no longer necessary, these privileges, the nobility, because the nobility themselves weren't serving that function effectively. And because they were also in debt because of their licentious lifestyles, that actually selling off their serfs would be economically advantageous to them at the same time. Mm. So I no, have a very cynical view on it. I, I mean, that is something that you see, right? Um, generally, after the Crimean War, is there's sort of um, a, a great disillusionment amongst the Russians and then sort of a a recognition that um uh, relatively speaking um you know if you look at the west they are um quite backwards i mean and, and there's a there's a real push for sort of um i mean not not just in terms of um um sort of culture but also you know technology and there's a real push towards things like um um you know telegraph lines and stuff like this right there had also been though a sorry him i'll just make my point there had also been a brief uprising in kiev during the crimean war and i also believe that what alexander the second was trying to do was to prevent any possible general Pergachev-esque uh, uprising of the serfs in the case of another war, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hitman, did you, did you have something to say? Yeah, what I was going to say is, um, just to apply a bit of um, political theory to the emancipation of the serfs, I do see a bit of um, the sort of the high-low middle mechanism as seen in Bertrand de Juvenel's on power. So the Tsar's the high, and he's empowering the low against the middle, which is the aristocracy. Well, this is, I mean, the direct quote from Alexander I is, I shall abolish serfdom from above before it can be abolished from below. So yes, this this is in a sense where he's appealing sort of 
beyond the aristocracy, appealing to the lower orders. And also this helps to, in many ways, centralize and further establish Russian autocracy, because it doesn't rely on this vast aristocracy who have all of these serfs who are under their possession. And of course, this extended to the Tsar himself, who also owned a vast number of serfs, um, serfs let lest we forget, and are also, as we mentioned, Columba, matters of economic efficiency. Uh, yeah. But just get, get I mean, there's get, this, um, uh, um, even, even the Tsar's son, um, it was the Duke Constantine, um, he he was uh, supposed to have remarked in the wake of the war. He said, um, "We cannot deceive ourselves any longer. We must say that we are both weaker and poorer than the first class powers, and furthermore poorer not only in material terms but in mental resources, especially in matters of administration." Which I suppose, um, you know, once we get into talking about the the struggles they had with supply and the fact that you know half of their men would die before they even reached the Crimea, um, you can understand how that view would uh, really crystallize for them. Well, this is all the more interesting because the passage I'm about to get to talks about Uvarov and his attempt to marshal the intellectual resources of Russia within a conservative framework, albeit we all know that in hindsight this fails. This formula is endlessly fruitful and may be applied to many sides of Russian state life. An obvious political even may, um, evil may not be corrected out of fear of the shaking the very foundations of the existing power. Nicholas I preferred to trust the recommendations of his elder brother, Tsarevich Konstantin Pavlovich, who wrote to him that the old Drevnost is the most reliable protection for government regulations, advising him to leave reform to the judgment of time. And again, that's a very Burkean aspect to him. In implementing the strategic turn in politics, the emperor undoubtedly felt the need for a system of gradual and organic development that, at the same time, occurs under governmental control. Necessary changes were postponed to some vague future but their reliability and solidity would be guaranteed by the very course of events. Thus, the responsibility for them was transferred for the authorities to the movement of history, the purely conservative functions of maintaining the state stability and preserving the fundamental basis of political order were left to the government. Uvarov, who was appointed Deputy Minister of Public Education early 1832, was able to present the emperor with the outline for this kind of system. His triad of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, which Pippin aptly labelled the theory of official nationalism, was fated to be the empire state ideology for many decades. Uvarov had correctly understood the emperor's cherished aspirations and subtly grasped the current needs of governmental politics. In Uvarov's opinion, Russia could count on recovery since the religious, political, and moral ideals that the supreme power wanted to spread still retained palpable force. Nevertheless, decisive and well-considered actions by the government were required because these ideals had been dissipated by premature and superficial civilization, fantasy systems, and reckless undertakings. They are disconnected, not unified into a whole, without a center, and moreover, over the course of 30 years, have had to withstand the assault of people and events. Uvarov's chronology is remarkable. The reference to 30 years unambiguously described the first years of Alexander I's reign, which was thus being rejected from start to finish, with all its hopes, disillusionments, victories, failures, and efforts of change, and in which Uvarov himself had actively participated. Uvarov had been a member of the government um, for 10 years up until this point. To characterize, actually 20 by 1833, to characterize the political style of Alexander and his close associates, Uvarov, and this is, I think, a fantastic term, better than my, uh, my schizophrenic description, Uvarov conceived the formula, administrative sansimonism, which is worthy of adoption by history books. Uvarov's definition does not so much indicate the visionary scope of the innovations of the Alexandrian era, but it does, uh, as it does their utopian fervor, as well as their armchair activism, based on the conviction that any problem may be solved with the help of abstract schemes, paper projects, and bureaucratic measures. In this sense, Arkacheyev's military colonies truly differed little from Saint-Simon's uh, phalanistries. Uh, just to emphasize who Saint-Simon is, Saint-Simon, like Robert Owen in the early 19th century... Yeah, he's like an was early a, socialist. Well, right? he coined the term socialism, was a socialist uh, u uh, utopian. But also, it does. Um, Speransky also needs to be mentioned in the sense that Alexander I wanted to wed the education of the clergy and the bureaucracy with the idea of amalgamating masonic lodges into the system as well in terms of solving <laughs> uh, solving russia's problems by use of these abstract theories which can only be you know uh, proven sort of philosophically so that is effectively the fundamental repudiation in the sense that in the same sense that metternich also referred to alexander as part jacobin or the jacobin czar um but again the idea of administrative sansimonism and you know you can say Arkacheyev with his military colonies. I mean, they are radical in the sense that 
through the army, he was attempting to actually supplant the family and have children raised by their commanders, which is all the more remarkable. And yeah. of course, has led to complete disaster and riots in them as well as disease. I mean, um, the soldiers, um, the soldiers had to serve for a really long time, didn't they? And so twenty five sort of, years. Yeah. Sort of. I wonder, was that sort of based on you know the the Roman legionaries serving for twenty five? But I, I think that's that's actually an interesting and fair analysis because. On the one hand, there's been a criticism of Nicholas I, especially, who in part continues an aspect of this, um, for emphasizing the role of the army in Russian life. But I do believe emphasizing on the idea that the Third Rome and Russia is the sort of in part some sort of restoration of an orthodox iteration of a Roman Empire that Alexander especially, I mean, towards the end of his life, as he was sort of steeped in his religious fervor, and you can say almost depression, um, that he believed that I have served at my post for 25 years. At that point, soldiers are entitled to retire. So yes, I completely agree with you that you can see this almost um, Aurelian-esque aspect of the soldier emperor leading his army, mm -hmm. um, rather than that simply as a, a dynast or you know, were something like a, a Louis the Sixteenth, you know, in Versailles. Um, so no, I completely agree with you, especially when you combine this with the personal austerity and the drill, um, the, the drill routine of Nicholas the First, who would get up every morning and practice bayonet drill. So no, I, I think I completely agree. Yeah, with I mean, you. it was a it, it was a very powerful way of sort of um um you know um how do you say it? molding people in 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 the way that the uh, the central government desired. I mean, I remember reading um. I think it's actually mentioned in um, Solzhenitsyn's last book. You know, there's this idea that um, um, with problem populations, um, but especially in that book, um, um, the Jewish population in Russia, um, it was sort of a means of trying to uh, russify and sort of standardize and bring in line the Jewish population by um, forcing them into military service, the long military service. Of course, um, you know, led to discontent, to say the least. But it's very interesting to see how the military is sort of used to further those political goals. Well, I also, enough. sorry, Hitman. I'm sorry. I was also going to say that with these military colonies, um, it seems um, a little bit of a Spartan agogi in there as well, considering um, how long it was for, and they're all being isolated away from the family. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. And I was just going to again, sort of. Uh, regarding Columbus point, I mean, it's interesting that the state of Israel today has that same philosophy regarding the Jewish population, albeit they are a Jewish state. Um, mm. But yes, um, rather idealistically, Nicholas I believed that the army was a source of uh, national integration and that Jews could be effectively integrated from the Pale of Settlement through military service, albeit uh, without that much success. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I especially, I know, it's, I know it's a little tangent, but I love, I remember there was an anecdote of, um, there was also a project to try and get um, um, Jewish families to farm and they would actually give them all of the farming equipment. And there were cases of um, farming, like farming equipment, you know, plows, horses being given to uh, um, um, Jewish merchants. And they just sold it all immediately and tried to, you know, um, um, you know, turn it into, you know, invest it in something or loan it to someone. Um, so old habits die hard, I guess. <laughs> Indeed. And what's the name of that Sol Solzhenitsyn book that's, that was from, sorry? Oh, that's um, uh, 200 Years Together, which um, I, I still ah. don't think you can get in English, actually, you know, in a, a hard copy. So. Oh, OK. Hmm. I mean, you can, you, can find, you can find PDFs online. It's more sort of whether or not you want to develop cataracts, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> reading PDFs. Uh, one way of referencing it is uh, Solzhenitsyn's other book. <laughs> the other book. The other book, yeah. <laughs> And also, this is an interesting point just to really emphasize that during the early reign of Nicholas I, before the Crimean War, Russia was considered the first military power in Europe, way before that of Prussia. And it, Prussia hadn't assumed its legendary reputation, which would assume in 1860s. And it was also a comparatively, compared to the population in Europe, it was a large population. We're talking around 70 million people and with a conscript army of around a million men. So Russia was seen as effectively militarily invincible before the Crimean War. So yeah, just to place yeah. this in this context. And they had a very good track record, didn't they? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, again, as I explained, up until this point, Russia hadn't suffered in any way such a decisive setback. Can I, can and, I ask you a question? Um, sorry, Mark, because after you... No, you go, Colin, but no, no, you go. I'll go after you. I, um, I, I was just going to ask, you, what is Metternich up to um, in this period? Metternich he, is... You know, he's alive and around, right? Yeah. Metternich is the imperial chancellor and he is the foreign secretary. And he demonstrates quite a lot of active influence domestically in Austria in terms of limited series of reforms. But very much because his whole concept of Europe relies on, again, multilateral cooperation um, and 
I would say really that the Orleanist flip in France really unmakes a lot of his plans. Yeah. And so he is focused instead on the consolidation and you can say the removal of French influence in Italy and the consolidation of Austrian control in the German Confederation. However, after the death of his political patron, uh, Emperor Franz and the regency of uh, Emperor Ferdinand after 1835, Ironically, Metternich is actually diminished in his position, even though he's ruling over an incompetent emperor, because as part of the regency plan, he has to share power with the Archduke Karl, and he also has to share power with his arch political rival, uh, Kolovrat. So it's not a mm. uh, perfect situation in Austria at this time. Because I assume you wouldn't have um, supported the sort of, um, I guess, the backstabbing of the Russians that comes when the, the war starts. But right? he's long gone at this point. He's still alive, as you know. He dies in 1858, but he's removed he's from a, power. A, dep a depressed old man. Yeah. Yes, he's removed from power as part of a, uh, you know, a, 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 essentially a political operation by Kolovrat at the beginning of the revolutions in 1848. And the, the betrayal happens in 1854. Anyway, back to um, this article. Um, oh, could I just interject there very briefly as well it was on the on the Absolutely, point of the russian yeah. army yeah. is that we've seen this because we did canvas this obviously in our napoleon streams where as uh many of oh, well, russia's major neighbors on the continent you know we could speak of um prussia uh, as a consequence of the the uh the war of uh, 1806 and napoleon and the aftermath of uh Jena and and Al Alistair, the essential destruction of the Prussian army and time and again from Napoleon's career from his early career in Italy to you know Austria sort of becomes almost a, a forced partner of the of the French Empire that the Austrians are, are beaten time and time again whereas with Russia we actually see for instance we, we did touch on uh, Kutuzov's campaign in Italy and how that was remarkably su uh, successful Suvorov. sorry Kutuzov Suvorov thank you um and then when Napoleon throws the Grand Army into Russia, and even though he does prevail at a very sort of bloody and clumsily fought Borodino, the Russians don't have their, the Russian military doesn't have their back broken. And in fact, Russia does arise out of the aftermath of that War of 1812, the invasion of 1812, and indeed the Napoleonic Wars writ large as a powerful state that has not had its army um either thrashed or broken by napoleon which is something that cannot be said for prussia and it cannot be said for austria uh, and it, it can't be said for sort of any other continental state essentially um and so one might uh, suggest that this russian army has sort of adapted and grown from the napoleonic period and it, it, obviously the russian army and we'll see when we get to the crimean war it does have its deficiencies it has dramatic deficiencies that are exposed by the crimean war but this perception of of russian strength is certainly one that is founded upon a a sound logic insofar as of its performance in the napoleonic wars and then it's russia's stature as a state afterwards that's worth keeping in mind by connecting the discredited administrative style with the name of the celebrated utopian thinker among the last heirs to the 18th century theoret uh, theoretical rationalism, Uvarov signaled that he himself intended to follow a totally different intellectual path. The connection of Uvarov's triad with the political theory of German romanticism was first explored more than 70 years ago by Gustav Schwett, who very generally, and in many ways by guesswork, indicated the dependence of Uvarov's ideas on the romantics, and in particular, on the state doctrine of the German historian Heinrich Luden. And indeed, in the very broad circle of sources for Uvarov's doctrine, which encompasses a wide spectrum of anti-revolutionary philosophy from Joseph de Maistre to Burke and Karamazin, Karamazin being the historian of the Russian Empire par excellence in the early 19th century, the political doctrine of the German romantics played a leading role. Uvarov's main source was evidently the books and lectures of Friedrich Schlegel. Uvarov lived in, and this is actually going back to your point, uh, Marcus, about Austria. Uvarov lived in Vienna from 1807 to mid-1809 at the time of the War of the Fifth Coalition, at the same time as Schlegel. He became acquainted with his brother, Olga Schlegel, and who accompanied Madame de Stahl and was consulting, a consultant um, in writing on Germany. Madame de Stahl, of course, was also important in terms of her role on the later you can say religious fervor inspired in Alexander I as he made many trips to Germany. It was in 1808 that Schlegel's book on the language and wisdom of the Indians came out and again just emphasize this in terms of possibly Russia's current policy. 
In it, it's all for demonstrating that Indian history, mythology, language, and literature not only lay at the basis of all European culture, but also infinitely surpassed all of Europe's achievements in its inner perfection. Uvarov sent a copy of this book to Karamazin in Petersburg and recommended it to Zhukovsky. More importantly, he himself was deeply taken by the idea of developing Eastern studies, which from the start took on a distinct political correlation. One year after returning to St. Petersburg, Uvarov proposed a project for an Asian academy, which would serve as the basis of his career in scholarship. Extensively citing Schlegel's work, Uvarov planned to turn the Russian capital into an international center of Oriental studies. In the project, he not only based his ideas on the geographical position and political interests of Russia, but also on the necessity of returning modern civilizations to its genuine roots. Nine years later, Uvarov wrote to Speransky, again, the discredited um, uh, favorite of Alexander I, who miraculously was able to restore his reputation and serve as a functionary under Nicholas I. The establishment and spread of Eastern languages should also help spread healthy ideas about Asia in its relationship to Russia. Here is a new source of national politics that should save us from premature decrepitude and from the European contagion. Now, who does that remind you of? I don't know. Spell it out for me, please. <laughs> yeah, same. Eurasianism and Dugan, but there you are. Ah, oh, oh, okay. Of course, yes. Relevant no, it, to recent it, events. But the, I mean, this is sort of—I mean, this period is sort of like the first bloom of sort of um, um, studying uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu sort of mythology and and governance, right? I mean, a bit later you sort of have Schopenhauer as well, and that's his sort of a, um, uh, one of his claim, uh, main claims to fame, right? Is that he? Uh, Schopenhauer, Goethe, heard all the way back to Voltaire and his fascination with Chinese civilization. One of the effects of the Enlightenment is yeah, you had the, the uh, what's it, the the uh, chinoiserie in France, right? Yes, sort of the absolutely. Chinese obsession, yeah. the, uh, the de-Europeanization and the Oriental sort of fascination with European scholarship henceforth. And this is a fundamental in terms of understanding Russia's political context. Is Russia part of Europe or is it part of Asia? And from this point of view, we're looking at a conception of Russian history, which not only repudiates Alexander's own what is referred to as armchair activism, but also Alexander's infatuation with French history and French ideas, and even sort of the aftershock of the French Revolution, and of course, the ideas of the Decemberists. It's interesting that so early, um, there's this idea of sort of um, looking at Indian history and early Indian texts for the sort of roots of their civilization. Because um, um, I, I was always under the impression that the sort of uh, um, you know Indo-European or, or or Aryan ideas came in came in a bit later, or or am I sort of misinterpreting? Well, it sort of begins really at the end of the 19th century and 18th century, sorry. And the 19th century is the sort of great era of prehistory. So you can say this is the beginning of these ideas and why someone like Uvarov will be so infatuated by them when he finds them. Mm. Uvarov, like Karamazin, was an educated conservative and at this time belonged to the same wing of Russian social thought. The enthusiasm that Schlegel's historical mysticism inspired in him reflected an important generational break in the development of Russian conservatism. This break had incalculable influence on the formation of national consciousness and in the future on the spirit of official Russian imperial ideology. As often happens, chance biograph biographical factors here turned out to be inseparable from deep historical processes. The time in which Uvarov and Schlegel came together was a very unique period in Austrian history. The atmosphere of three months of these months was greatly determined by the expectation of a military clash with Napoleon. The anti-Napoleonic coalition that had come together in Vienna and at that time bizarrely united almost totally opposing forces, remnants of the French ancien regime, the aristocratic emigres and young German nationalists. Uvarov himself later wrote about this fact that this crusade united all the independent salons and all the peoples that were not drawn into the orbit of the great captain and that these allies, of course, great captain being an allusion to Napoleon, and that these allies were not welded together by any common creed, apart from the desire of bringing down the imperial tyranny of Napoleon. Due to his philosophical system, Schlegel was the natural leader of this strange alliance. He had been invited to Vienna by Stadion, the head of the hawks at the Austrian court, to give a course of public lectures on history. This was meant to help cultivate national self-consciousness on the part of the German public. These public lectures were the basis for the book he sent to Uvarov um, that did not take place in Vienna in 1809 due to the war. Instead, they were delivered the year after the defeat. With the start of the military action, Schlegel received the position of court secretary and was attached to the army headquarters. There, he published the newspaper 
Osterreichs Zeitung and published the Austrian Times and published proclamations in which he tried to convince the Germans that Austria was waging a war on behalf on their behalf and that only thanks to Austria would Germany gain independence and freedom. At the heart of Schlegel's political view of these years lay the conception of the nation as an integral personality, a unity based on blood relations and secured by common customs and language. In his philosophical lectures of 1804 to 1806, which presented the fullest, most de detailed exposition of the system, he says, the notion of the nation presumes that all of its members compose a single personality. For this to be possible, they must all have the same origin. The older, purer, and less mixed with other races, the more the nation will have common customs. And the more of these cust um, common customs and the more attachment to them it manifests, the greater the degree to which a nation will be formed from this race. In this connection, language has supreme importance because it serves as unconditional proof of common origins and binds the nation with the most vital and natural links. Together with the commonality of customs, language is the strongest and most reliable guarantee that the nation will live for many centuries in indissoluble unity. Schlegel divided the ethnos race into a national, into a natural community and a nation that arises on the basis of an ethnos as a political formation. This collective personality should also develop into a state. Schlegel's idea of a national state was the medieval limited monarchy in which the unity of the natural organism was guaranteed by division in intercorporations. In the philosopher's opinion, the national rebirth and unification of Germany should occur around Austria, which had best preserved medieval state institutions, the ancient aristocracy, the dynasty of the Habsburgs and the Catholic church. These ideas obviously depend on Herder's philosophy on the one hand, and on Rousseau and the ideologists of the French Revolution on the other. In distinction from Herder, Schlegel shifts the emphasis and the concept of the nation from cultural and religious factors to political ones. On the contrary, Schlegel also parted company from the French in that he saw the nation not as participants in a social contract originating from Locke originally, but as the product of organic development. Accordingly, he understood the state in natural historical terms as a spontaneous expression of a people's history. Our common duty consists in accomplishing the people's education in accord with the supreme objective of the most august monarch, the combined spirit of orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality. Uvroff wrote in a circular that was distributed to school districts on March the 21st, 1833, in connection with his appointment as Minister of Popular Education, also known as the Minister of Public Enlightenment. It's a very it's a very interesting sort of blend, isn't it? Because I mean, I'm just looking briefly now um, at Schlegel's biography, you know, born into a um, a, a fervent Protestant family, he abandons Protestantism and becomes, you know, a typical sort of atheist individualist. But then he returned to Christianity and converted to Catholicism. And so I think that sort of um, um, uh, the strange course of his life is is reflected in this philosophy. He sort of, um, he's, he, you know, he, he gives credence to um, uh, um, you know, the ideas of nationalism, but also has this respect for the older feudal forms. It's very interesting. You can see how that would appeal to the Russians as well. This is why it's important to sort of see modern, the modern right or modern political conservatism as arriving in part as a reaction to, but also you can say a distortion or a recontextualization of the ideas of said enlightenment. And this also reflects on Uvarov as well. Uvarov started off as a liberal infatuated with Greek, Greek, uh, Greek literature, um, of course, being, a, a, you can say, a typical part of the French establishment at that time, he wrote and thought in French, and he obviously became a German nationalist, at the same time becoming the principal minister responsible for the creation of an imperial ideology for Russia, <laughs> in terms of trying to contextualize these inner contradictions with the individuals creating these new systems. Very interesting. Yeah, just as schizophrenic as the, the old Tsar, I suppose. <laughs> Naturally, orthodoxy headed this list. Thus, in his memorandum to the emperor, Uvarov had begun his description of the triad with a discussion of its religious component. Without a people's religion, the people, like an individual person, are doomed to destruction. To deprive them of faith is to remove them of their heart, their blood, their insides. This means to put them on the lowest level of their physical and moral order. This means to betray them. Even national pride rebels against such an idea. A person who is devoted to the fatherland will just as little agree with the loss of one tenant to the reigning church as he would to stealing one of the pearls from the crown of the monomach, 
course, the crown of the monomach was the crown which was mm. originally given to Ivan Kalinka. It was the national crown before the creation of, um, uh, I believe it was Catherine the Great's crown during her coronation in 18, uh, sorry, 1762. Um, but again, the fusion of orthodoxy with nationalism, but also should be noted um, that this is doesn't sort of demonstrate the same messianism as, say, for example, the idea of the Third Rome, that it is imperative for the Christian order that Moscow be held, and without Moscow, the world will fall, for there shall be no fourth Rome. Instead, I'm detecting, as with so much of the sort of romantic conservative thought emanating from the French Revolution, that this is very much pragmatic. This is very yeah, much almost that's more cynical. Yeah, definitely. In the sense that Napoleon yeah. would have conceived a religion. Yeah, it's also much this idea of, um, um, you know, we're, we are, yeah, as you say, we're Orthodox, we're the heirs to Byzantium. It's more this sort of recognition that we need Orthodoxy to preserve stability in the state. And as you say, it is sort of um, postmodern and relative, isn't it? This idea that each people has their faith. I mean, that's, that's not an idea that would have been attractive in the past, is it? Well, this is emblematic of the Holy Alliance in its sort of core. I mean, at the core, the Holy Alliance is ecumenical. It is the union of a Protestant king, a Catholic emperor, and an Orthodox Tsar yeah. in defense of a anti, explicitly anti-Napoleonic, anti-French revolutionary world order. And of course, if you look at it from a denominational point of view, this is atrocious. This is completely atrocious, but it's bound with the political realities in which we almost have a pragmatic assumption that, well, these religions, we can put aside our interdenominational differences so long as we oppose liberalism and the French Revolution. Yeah. So, yes, there is a fundamental aspect of pragmatism and postmodernism wedded to this idea, which is also demonstrative of the political climate post Napoleon. Very interesting. We we may surmise that Uvarov assigned orthodoxy a functional role as a religious principle, insofar as it was subordinated to the state principle of autocracy. The strength of autocratic power represents the necessary condition for the existence of the empire in its current form. Let political dreamers who are off their heads due to false notions, who think up schemes about how things should be in the ideal, be shocked by appearances, inflamed by theories, animated by words, we can answer them that they do not know the country and are mistaken about its positions, its needs, its desires. If it accepted the chimera of limited monarchy, equal rights for all the states, national representation in the European manner, and a pseudo-constitutional form of rule, the Colossus, i.e. the Russian Tsardom, would not last two weeks. And what's more, it would collapse even before the false transformations would be completed. And if anything, that's actually quite correct when we look Prescient, at Prescient, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If according to Uvarov, autocracy was a conservative principle, nationality presumes neither movement backward nor immobility. The state organization must and should develop like the human body. And it is precisely this principle, very much heard or influence, and this precisely this principle of nationality that guarantees the continuity of this development, at the same time allowing it to preserve the main elements that are inherent to the national personality. The responsibility for supporting and spreading this principle lies with the government, and in particular, on the system of popular education that it creates. Uvarov had already been casting about for such an evolutionary metaphor in his speech of 1818. In this case, a theory of government resembles the theory of education. That which can perpetuate physical or moral infancy is not worthy of praise. The government is most wise that can facilitate transitions from one age to another while submitting to the law of necessity, grows and matures together with the people or with the individual. Now, Uvarov tried to fill this scheme with concrete content and, of course, the law of necessity. Spengler himself sort of indicates his original indebtedness to Goethe and all of the German romantics who give this idea. And this idea is also prevalent in Carlyle as well, given the sort of, you can say, the provident, providential nature of history which he assigns. In the more or less distant future, the development of Russian nationality would unavoidably have to create the necessary state institutions. Therefore, the corresponding governing bodies, first and foremost, the Ministry of Popular Enlightenment, under the watchful eye of its newly appointed leader, had to establish control over the direction of this evolution. Uvarov fully understood the complexities connected with introducing such a contemporary and two-edged category as nationality for the basis of the empire state ideology. As an observer of the national revolutions in Europe, he recognized that historically the principles of autocracy and nationalism could clash. However, he presumed that whatever these quarrels or altercations might be, that they had to be overcome. They lived a common life and could not and could enter into alliance and conquer together. And again, in terms of the 
potential alterca altercations. I mean, this is explicit during the French Revolution when the royal army of France mutinies against the king, against the king in the name of France and against and in the name of the people. The idea of the Volk, the nationality, the popular will as representative of the nationality rather than the king who was seen. I mean. Such was the hatred of the French aristocracy during the French Revolution that they were even ethnically sort of ostracized from the sort of Gallican French um, body politic and referred to yeah. as Franks in the sense that there was these uh, Teutonic invaders. Yeah, they're, yeah, they subjugated the um, the sort of old Roman population. I mean, I also, I mean, I mean, what would you say is the relation to um, the situation in in Greece and the formation of the um, orthodoxy autocracy and nationality? Because of course, you do have the um, um, as we've talked about in the, in the previous stream. The two strains of the sort of Greek revolution, you know, the sort of the Orthodox um, Byzantine um, sort of tradition, and then also the um, the Hellenic sort of focus on the nation or the people. Do you think that's sort of um, um you know, is there some sort of connection between that and the developments in Russia? I believe that there was an attempt, I would say a far more cynical attempt in the Greek case, to wed these ideas for the political utility of the nationalists. So if we're going to do this in a ranking, then nationality would come before orthodoxy. Rather, orthodoxy facilitates nationalism, rather than orthodoxy being placed ahead of nationalism, which is why we are simply left with the truncated iteration of Greece and the Peloponnese and Attica, rather than the orthodox commonwealth within the ottoman empire transforming into a greek nation if that makes sense may, may i just add a slight point to there as well on Absolutely. the greek yeah. question here that columbus raised quite quite nicely is that an important distinction to to notice here in regards to that specific question columba is what are the origin points of those two you might say takes on on greek identity or 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 which uh uh what are the origin points of, of either elements of that thought? And within Greece, you know, by the, by the revolutionaries, by the, by the leadership, you know, whether it's the, the generals such as Colochtronus or whether it's the intellectual elite such as um, you know, Ypsilantus or um, uh, John Capodistrius, the Greeks saw themselves as the sort of residual inheritors of a, a Byzant Byzantine empire that had been sort of conquered by the Turks but lived on in the Greek people. This is why even up until I, I, I believe that men who had fought and um, survived, say, World War II and the Civil War, that generation up until they died would use terms such as Greeks, Hellenes, Romeoi um, interchangeably, right? But the intellectual influence from the West into Greece, from places like France and like Britain that had, you know, how, how shall I say, endured the taint of liberalism, are the ones who imposed upon the nascent new Greek state this um, specifically classical interpretation of Greek identity, of, of, of an ancient Greece, whereby this thousand-year Byzantine Orthodox Commonwealth is completely vacant from that uh, could thinking. I, could I add another element of irony, though, to that, Marcus? I would hmm. say it's less yeah. intellectually, this is less a pure construct from the West, rather that this is an intellectual construct created by the same class who were empowered and responsible for the administration of the Roman realm within the Ottoman Empire, mm. which is the Fenariotis. Indeed. The and of course, we, uh, exactly. And of course, it's in this period as well, which I, I assume we're going to get to very soon, that we see this same um, harking back to um, the ancient period and ancient pride um, amongst mm. the Slavs more generally, right? Hmm. Uh, just if, if I could just ad address our, a good friend of ours in the chat here, just John Komnenos, because uh, obviously we share a love for this subject. Um, kind of cringe that the Byzantine identity was subverted by Greek nationalism and liberalism. I know this is about Greece. I don't want to harp on about it. But what do you mean by that, John? It, uh, as in the, the Greeks themselves had or w were cringe doing it or that the identities themselves were mangled? If you can just reply to just add us in the chat. That'd be good. I'd like to know. To, to, prevent, to prevent this conversation going too far off track, yeah. uh, Columbo and I'll I save it for the end. Band did discuss this quite a lot um, in the discussion of Greek independence. Oh, indeed. Um, I, I, we'll touch at the end. I just, I just want to know what he thinks. But we'll okay, move but on. I, I just, sorry, I just want to move away from Greece. I just no, wanted of course, to of course. to Columbo's point. Of course. Um, nevertheless, almost everywhere, ideas of national unity were directed at breaking down class divisions that threatened the national organism's integrity. In the final analysis, the issue had to do with transforming traditional imperial structure, sorry, into institutions of the national state 
It is precisely in the sense that nationality was understood in Decemberist and quasi-December circles in the later 1810s and early 1820s. The same applies to the Slavophiles in the 1830s and the 1850s, right up into the era of the great reforms of Alexander II. Uvarov abdicated the same slogan in order to preserve either as a democratic aspect and a, even a particularist aspect in some pan-Slavist and Slavophile thought wedded to this idea of nationalism. Uvarov advocated the same slogan in order to preserve the existing order of things indefinitely. The kind of change in mission demanded a profound rethinking of the very category of nationality, and his memorandum, such a reconsideration was realized with the exceptional incentiveness and even a distinctive elegance. He, unable to base his understanding of nationality on objective factors, Uvarov deci uh, decisively shifts his focus into subjective ones. His argumentation belongs completely to the sphere of historical emotions and national psychology. Russia still retains religious convictions, political convictions, moral convictions in her, beast, in her, in her breast, sorry, the single pledge of her happiness, the remnants of her nationality, the precious and final guarantees of its political future. In the words of the author of the memorandum, several years of special studies allowed him to assert that there are three great linchpins of religion, autocracy and nationality constitute the cherished legacy of our fatherland. Thus, the basis for nationality turns out to be convictions. Simply put, a Russian is someone who believes in his church and his sovereign. Having defined orthodoxy and autocracy in terms of nationality, Uvarov now defines nationality in terms of orthodoxy and autocracy. In formal logic, this kind of maneuver is called a vicious circle, but ideology is built on a qualitatively different law, and this risky rhetor uh, rhetor uh, rhetor rhetorical pirouette turns out to be the weight-bearing element of this entire new official construction. This line of reasoning had long-term consequences for Russian state ideology. If only those Russians who profess the national religion may be members of the reigning church, then old believers, old believers in the sense that those who were struck off during the reforms of um, uh, Nikon in the 17th century, and sectarians among the lower orders of society are excluded, as well as converted Catholics, deists, and skeptics in the higher ones. In exactly the same way, if nationality necessarily presumes acceptance of autocracy, any constitutionalist or republican automatically foregoes the right to be Russian. This approach is uncannily similar in the model of the Soviet person developed by the communist regime, as someone to whom a strictly prearranged set of views and conviction is ascribed. A non-Soviet person in this ideological system cannot be considered part of the people, and is declared to be a renegade, or in Russian, Oshevenet. In the early 19th century, the term used for this phenomenon was isverg, or a monster outcast. The issue was to create an ideological system that would preserve the possibility of Russia belonging to European civilization, outside of which Uvarov neither conceived of himself nor of his work as Minister of Popular Enlightenment. At the same time, such a system would protect the country from the civilization by, the mean, by means of an imper impermeable barrier. In Uvarov's formulation, the dilemma consisted of how to march in step with Europe and not move away from our own place. What art must we master in order to take from the Enlightenment only what is necessary for our great empire and to firmly reject that which contains the seed of disorder and shocks? For many decades, the Russian authorities would ask themselves how to appropriate the achievement of Western civilization and not the system of social values that had given rise to them. And this is the age old question is how to wed a conservative reactionary world order with ultimately social, military and technological innovation, which prevents the enlightened world from overcoming and completely sort of eviscerating the more sort of uh, hierarchical and ancient civilizations. And this is also during the time of the Opium Wars, it should be mentioned. And you can say the perfect example of this, of a ancient civilization, which is beholden to the ideas of the dynastic system of Chinese imperial politics, which has been assailed by the power of Great Britain and the expansionism and indeed yeah. its liberalism. I suppose, I suppose also you see the exact same thing in Japan with the, <laughs> Meiji, with the Meiji restoration as well, right? Yes, absolutely. And uh, this comes in you know, a couple of a decade later, but absolutely is the same phenomenon. And yes, and you, do, doesn't end well for the Russians. <laughs> it doesn't end well for the Russians, but you could say the Meiji, the Meiji sort of solution is one of the proposed solutions to this in the same way that Uvarov is trying to achieve the same thing for Russia and arguably, given the scope of his lifetime, completely fails. Mm. In the late I, 18th, I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, hard uh, circle to square, though, isn't it? Mm. 
In the late 1810s, Uvarov proposed that the study of the East could save Russia from the European infection. Now he had in mind constructing intellectual levees capable of changing the natural flow of ideas, inculcating into young people the desire to become better acquainted with the fatherland's history, paying greater attention to our nationality in all of its diverse manifestations. It is unquestionable, he continued, that this kind of affinity for works that are continuing, substantial, inoffensive, will serve as a kind of support against the influence of so-called European ideas. Encouraging study and research in the field of Russian history was basically the only positive proposal that Uvarov was able to put forward. The past was ordained to replace the empire's perilous and uncertain future, and Russian history, with its deeply rooted institutions of orthodoxy and autocracy, was to become the single repository of nationality and the ultimate alternative to Europeanization. In suggesting that loyalty to the church, to the throne, were the main features of Russian nationality, Uvarov was forced to presume that these feelings unite incalculable, the incalculable majority of the countrymen, at the same time as the senseless passions for innovation without restraint or reasonable plan to unexpected destructive consequences, characterize an extremely insignificant circle of people in Russia and serves as the credo for a school that is so weak that it, is not, that it not only cannot increase its number of its adherents, but loses them on, on a daily basis. One may assert there is no doctrine less popular in Russia because there is no system that would offend so many ideas, be hostile to so many interests, be so fruitless and surrounded by mistrust to any greater extent. And what he's really alluding to here is the prevalence of secret societies and the need of, say, for example, organizations such as Freemasonry, or if we go back to the Greek example of the Philiki Eteria, to be able to allow these ideas to exist, survive, and indeed to cause the harm he's talking about. And this is obviously a reference to the Decemberists, which again, their ideas survive through the network of secret societies and the radicalization of the Polish officer cadets during the Polish rising in 1830. Yeah. In such a situation- I, I would say as well, um, I think um, uh, you, know, you have the, uh, I think the Slavic Brotherhood as well. And their um, you know, sort of books and pamphlets and stuff did not sell very well at all. So uh, it was sort of difficult for them to um, build momentum. Yes, I mean, we look at the society, say, for example, of uh, St. Cyril and Methodius later and the Ukrainian Herodnas as well. Again, it was very much a upper middle class or even an aristocratic institution. In such a situation, indeed, this is very sort of prescient if you look at Russian literature as well. And just one character which I need to get on, because again, Nicholas I is if anyone knows anything about him, uh, is for his legendary persecution of uh, Pushkin. Uh, nevertheless, whilst Pushkin was in many senses a liberal, and his work was actually personally censored by Nicholas I, because Nicholas I enjoyed reading him, so wanted that privilege to himself, uh, Pushkin was very pro-national, uh, pro-Russian nationalism, to the extent that he was almost sort of, uh, uh, <laughs> what's the word to describe it, um, euphoric, at Russia's crushing of the Polish revolt in 1830 and 1831. In suggesting, sorry, in such a situation and social dynamic, it was seen that the government had nothing to worry about. Nonetheless, Uvarov prepared for a difficult struggle. The perspectives for which he was by no means inclined to be optimistic. Despite what he said, literally two paragraphs previously among the factors that threatened the final victory of his mission was the universal state of people's minds, and in particular, that of the generation that is graduating today from our bad schools, whose moral neglect we perhaps should reproach ourselves, a lost generation, if not an agno agnostic one, a generation of ignoble beliefs, bereft of enlightenment, grown old before it had a chance to enter life, withered away by ignorance and fashionable sophisms, whose future will bring no benefit to the fatherland. And of course, this is referring to the failed experimentation of education within the Russian system, especially that uh, pioneered by Speransky. But in particular, he's referring to, you can say, the corrupting influences of Western liberalism and how this has made it virtually actually impossible or conducive to enable a successive generation, which is again inheriting from that generation, to build up a genuine cultivated sense of orthodoxy, nationality um, and uh, autocracy, uh, given the agnostic and as I refer to the schizophrenic nature of the administration and Alexander I and the general, again, you can say apathy it generated towards Russian conservative and Russian nationalism. Defeatist notes resound in Uvrov's letter. His mission, as he himself conceived it, was on the one hand rooted in the nature of national existence and on the other infinitely lonely and Sisyphean, of course, the Sisyphean referring to Sisyphus, who I believe I've actually used this analogy sometimes on this uh, podcast, 
Uvroff wrote that he would defend the breach which the emperor had commanded him to fill until the last, but expressed misgivings that he would be able to overcome by force these circumstances. An influential statesman summoned to formulate and implement a new system of state consciousness, he felt himself, as before, an exotic flower, unable to put down roots in his native soil, as he had characterized himself 18 years earlier in his letter to Stein, the uh, minister in Prussia. This situation seems quite paradoxical. Given the Russians' love for the native principles of national life that Uvarov postulated, where could that generation, whose disposition was described in terms that today almost seem like quotations from Lamantov's poem, Thought, written six years later, have come from? And why did the task of raising future generations in the spirit of Russian nationality seem so dangerous and unattainable to the future minister? Of course, a significant measure of responsibility for such a situation predates Uvarov. Rather, it lies with the state's ideological apparatus, whose permissiveness and lack of well-considered policy had allowed the evil to penetrate so deeply. Yet the main reason for the spread of anti-national tendencies lies elsewhere. The very metaphor of intellectual levies suggests that Uvarov was trying to partition um, off a current of thought which he himself thought was natural. In his opinion, Russia had for a moment avoided the humiliation like that which Europe had suffered after the July Revolution of 1830. But the very phrase has not arrived at the point of disgrace, indicates that he clearly discerned an analogous evolution for Russia. Also very pessimistic, Uvarov sensed the fragility of the Russian government's mode of being, and above his cited assertion that if reformers began, the emperor would not be able to the empire would not be able to survive two weeks. Apparently, while Uvarov saw the European path of development as ruinous for Russia, he simply could not envisage any serious alternative. As one of the most authoritative scholars of nationalism, Anderson has written in Russia's official nationalism, the wild merger of nation dynastic empire developed after and in reaction to the popular national movements proliferating in Europe since the 1820s. It was only that a certain inventive uh, leg legitimate man was required to permit the empire to appear attractive in national drag. Consequently, in historical practice, the experience of Western nation states inevitably served as the measure for any realization of this very nationalism. The intellectual drama of Russian state nationalism consisted in the following, the key notion of nationality or nationalism, nationalité or Volkstum, which had been developed by Western European social thinkers to legitimize a new social order that was replacing the traditional confessional and dynastic principles of the state system. But Uvarov's triad declared that precisely those institutions that nationalism had been summoned to destroy were the cornerstones of Russian nationality, the reigning church and imperial absolutism. In fulfilling Russia's mon uh, the Russian monarchy's political mandates, Uvarov attempted to unite the contradictory demands of the time and to preserve the existing order, but his European education proved stronger than the traditionalism he had adopted. Nationalism thus predominated over both orthodoxy and autocracy, turning them into ethnographically ornamental components of national history. I think this is a very incisive point in the sense that Russian nationalism, as it conceives here under orthodoxy and or, um, under orthodoxy and autocracy, is very much conceived in a isolationist and anti-European vein, whilst at the same time it is riding on those intellectual currents that will be responsible for, in, for the Italian unification and indeed the German unification. And I think you can see, Columba, in this idea that there is no reason as to why this needs to be confined to Russian stock, that incorporating these ideas of pan-nationalism. You can incorporate other people, especially if you go back to Schlegel's first iteration, that language is the cornerstone mm, of any yeah. national community. What is distinctive about the Slavic communities, despite the fact they are not bound by autocracy and orthodoxy, they are bound by language familiarity. And so we can imagine a new community which is built up around this new language community of all the southern, western, and of course, eastern Slavs, despite their disparate historical um, traditions. So on the one hand, you can say if Uvarov is reliant on Schlegel's interpretation, then the notion of communities based on language and states as arriving out of a sense of organic process and history are mutually incompatible with one another, which creates this, you can say, fundamental schism within Russian nationality. And one needs to be emphasized that as far as I'm concerned, during the reign of Nicholas I, this conservative sense of Russian nationality, which isn't even based on ethnicity or language, as indeed loyalty to the system, which is Russian, very much permeates Nicholas's reign and indeed his perception of 
monarch who is responsible to the concept of Europe and the preservation of the post-Napoleonic world order. But when he falls and Russia suffers this great humiliation in the process of this soul searching and indeed the portrayal of Russia by Austria, we see a far more belligerent Russian nationalism that emerges out of this. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment to say, Columbo? Oh, I do, yeah. I, I also find it very interesting and, and I suppose ironic that um, um, in the case of the Russians, but also especially in the case of many of the, the Slavic peoples and the Slavic nationalists, is that um, one of the key components of that nationalism is a sort of, um, especially, you know, the, the Slavic populations within the Austrian Empire, there's that um, uh, rejection of the you know, sort of German supremacy, right? And this idea that we can be on the uh, equal footing with the Germans and they're not this um, superior um, um, race, I suppose, but it's fascinating that um, in order to arrive at that conclusion, that, that conclusion, they've essentially um, drawn that from German philosophers and German thinkers. So it's it's very strange. Yes, the, the fundamental aspects of trying to incorporate what is best about the Enlightenment without falling to its pitfalls, which we saw during the French Revolution. Um, in this case, you can say that nationalism is, you can say, arguably inherently progressive, and that when we see the final fruition of this idea, it's not even really nationalism at all, but it's just loyalty you can argue, a profession of loyalty to a national creed, um, which is why this idea doesn't really stick around very long. And then we see the, the twin sort of ideas that come out of that, which is on the one hand, pan-Slavism, and on the other, Russification, which only really begins in earnest again after the reign of Nicholas I and the fall and death of Uvarov. Mm. And just on a quick note, because this is, uh, I forgot to sort of mention here, the uh, actual sort of slide to go with this, um, but just on a quick note to get to the gendarme of Europe before we arrive at the Crimean War and the Great Betrayal. So the effectiveness of the system was that when we have the revolutions of 1848, the third section of the imperial chancellery and the gendarme of the Russian Empire was able to prevent a revolution occurring within Russia at this time. Um, I think believe Russia was characterized as a bottle of vodka. Um, compared to the rest of Europe, without a bubble, um, effectively, <laughs> regardless like of that, that. Inter regardless of that interpretation, and regardless of the weakness within Russia that's about to be exposed by the Crimean War, Russia, at least superficially, to the West of European observers, and again combined with Uvarov's um, political ideology conception of Russian history, has been successful in preventing, say, for example, a renewed conflict even in the peripheries. So, say, for example, in the areas which are Baltically uh, Baltic German, Livonia and of course Poland and the peripheral regions of the empire, the Caucasus, Bessarabia, what have you. The revolution starts off with the affair of banquets which deposes Louis Philippe and he's repl replaced by a, another French Republican regime that spreads over to Germany, leads to a premature uh, confederation of the Germans in Frankfurt, which is put down principally by Austrian and Prussian arms. There is a national uprising in Italy, which is supported, importantly, by a state within Italy, which hitherto had been an ally of Austria, Piedmont, under King Albert and his new um, uh, Albertine constitution. And this is defeated during uh, uh, Radetzky's uh, great uh, military march at the beginning of 1849. However, in Hungary, we have the rebellion of uh, Lajos Kosov, and one of the great effects of this is that this causes a fundamental breaking down of the system of the system of power in Austria. I, I, really, it's hard to see how sort of catastrophic this would have been had it not been for the Russian intervention. Due to the political nature of the system within Austria, Metternich was thrown out, thrown out of the boat. He was uh, thrown under the bus or whatever sort of analogy you can use to refer to that. And Kolovrat was unable to take over the reins from Metternich and he was soon replaced. Um, the king, Ferdinand, was seen as completely useless in terms of being able to actually do anything. However, in regards to Austria's own unique constitutional situation, getting Franz Josef on the throne meant that due to the, uh, the imperial system of negotiating with the empire and the coronation oath, having a uncrowned emperor who wasn't crowned king of Bohemia or king of Hungary, like, um, uh, like Ferdinand was, meant that the emperor could try and transform and retain control of the empire through military force alone. And Therefore, it is the combination of Franz Josef, his chief minister von Schwarzenberg, and Nicholas I and his intervention that crushes the Hungarian rising under Lajos Kofov and the first major attempt to magyarize and center a nation of Hungary around the lands of St. Stephen or the ancient sort of territory of Hungary. And for this, 
Nicholas I receives the praise of, again, the seemingly reactionary, reactionary press within Europe, because both Prussia under Frederick Wilhelm IV has conclusively rejected the idea of German unification under a Prussian Aegis, a brief attempt at Prussian maneuvering to force Austria to accept a diminished role within the Congress of Europe, uh, the, the Congress, sorry, the, uh, the German Confederation fails, and for more all intents and purposes, by 1851, within Germany and within Italy, the Pope is restored. Um, Austria itself is re-secured and you can say reconsolidated. And Nicholas I has defended that last aspect of the Metternichian order, even though Metternich himself, as you know, Columbo has already uh, pointed to, has been ostracized from this political system and he's effectively in political exile after this and replaced by Schwarzenberg who in turn were replaced by von Bach. So Russia's position actually looks rather good in terms of the context of this with one major exception. France, which had been that original node of subversion within the concept of Europe by replacing the Bourbons with Louis Philippe, that political system has collapsed and rather than becoming more conservative, one Louis Napoleon Bonaparte has been elected as the president of the French. And in 1851, Napoleon Bonaparte the third will effect a coup and create the second French empire. And this is really important to understand in the sense of Russian and the Crimean history, because all of a sudden, we have a new sort of pseudo revolutionary regime in France, mm. and it is Bonapartist. So Napoleon is going to appeal to the legacy of his uncle in that he wants to pursue a policy of grandeur or, again, the idea of French predominance, French influence within Europe and indeed the world. Yeah. Um, and doesn't, so, um, don't, don't the Russians refuse to recognize his imperial title? In the same way that they refuse to acknowledge Louis Philippe as the rightful king of France as well, absolutely. Because again, the the assumption of an imperial title is, you know, doubly offensive. On the one hand, you're claiming equality with the with the European powers who defeated Napoleon, and the, on the on the other hand, you're appealing to his legacy, <laughs> which is both yeah. verboten in this sense, but of course, due to the the need of Prussia, Austria, Germany, and Italy, and Russia to consolidate after this, there is no mood to declare war in France without direct provocation. It's not like a hundred years, a hundred days campaign thing, where Napoleon comes back from Elba and all of Europe decides to declare Napoleon an enemy of humanity. There isn't that same sense of a uh, mission mm. towards getting rid of Napoleon the Third once he proclaims his imperial aspirations yeah. in 1851. And, and of uh, course, as Marcus is completely familiar with, uh, Napoleon will not turn out to be in any way an effective imitation of his uncle. Yeah, he's not. He's no. not as belligerent to say the least. I mean, a, a key part of sort of um, his his appeal and sort of part of his political message is this idea of um, um, the empire is peace, right? You know, he wants to focus on sort of. Um, um improvement in many different senses improvement of, of uh, infrastructure yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, and, I'll push back i'll push back against that columba in the sense that there are two divisions of napoleon's reign one is the napoleon wannabe um which really ends after solferino and then there is as you say the liberal empire which does focus i mean most famously on the houseman reforms around paris but napoleon never gives up his expansionist aims. However, by the 1860s, he wants to do so without actually lifting a finger militarily, and with the exception of, of course, Mexico, and all of his designs are ultimately disastrous. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um... Hello? Yeah, Mark. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah. So, well, I'm loath to quote Karl Marx, but his quote on this, I think, is very fitting, where he said, um, history often repeats itself. The first time was tragedy, the second time was farce. Yes, and uh, of course, this is from uh, the coup of Brumaire, which uh, yeah, Marx dedicated to the uh, the ascent. And of course, he was writing in Paris at this time. So um, absolutely couldn't concur uh, concur with Marx more, which I never thought I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so this actually, after a very long preamble into the state of Russia, gets us to the Crimean War and all the issues which sort of surround it because you need to set up france you need to set up the revolutionary tradition and you need to set up britain as being fundamentally subversive against the concept of europe in order to understand why nicholas the first who again is seemingly 
very conservative and is wanting to distance himself from European entanglements, finds himself in a position where he is facing a European coalition, the likes of which has only been organized for previous rulers like I, I'm curious, um, when does this when does this article by Levine sort of come into this? Because well, really, in terms of this, my my notion, my argument here is the transformation of Russian nationalism into pan-Slavism as basically you know, lip service to the ideas of a potential Russian expansionism in the Balkans. And this comes, um, something I really should have iterated at the beginning, I'm sorry if I didn't make this clear, is this conversation is going to end in 1878. The reason being I want to draw a comparison between the Crimean War and the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878, because they are polar opposite in terms of Russian aspirations and Russian aims, and of course, outcomes. Um, and we have the lingering elements of international sort of intervention with the Congress of Berlin. But nevertheless, I want to bring up pan-Slavism, or really, Columba, for you to bring up pan-Slavism in this moment, because up until now, pan-Slavism really isn't in evidence anywhere. I mean, the remarkable thing is, I mean, you'll, you'll no doubt bring up with Austria. I mean, if you want, you can just bring up um, elements of pan-Slavism that existed within Austria during 1848, because that could be relevant here. Because I just want to sort of illustrate that... Um, I, I, I might struggle, though. I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, okay, well, how about you, you read the segment sort of before 1848, or... Or, or maybe we can, we can just dispense with it. <laughs> um, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure if you're 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 running out of time, really. Um, <laughs> I'm run, running out of time. I'm running out of stamina. I mean, you know, I was up um, a very very long train journey yesterday. I'm afraid. Oh dear. Well, maybe we can get your section on the charge of the light brigade then before you can go. Very good. So uh, if we get there, maybe. But uh, by, by the looks of it, unfortunately, we'll have to. I'll have to sort of uh, eschew that for this evening's conversation. I can just wing it as usual. Um, so on to the Crimean War. One fundamental sticking point throughout the entire 19th century is control of the Mediterranean and indeed preventing Russian access into the Mediterranean through control of the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus Straits. Yeah, because all they have are their sort of wretched ports in the north, right? Yeah, so, as, yeah. as a consequence of Russian expansionism in the late 18th century under Catherine the Great, Russia has now established itself as a formidable Black Sea power. Indeed, when we look at Orlov's revolt in the original war, um, the, the Russian fleet did in fact engage in the Aegean theatre as well and get as far as Alexandria and raiding parts of the eastern Mediterranean at the same time. So this is significant in terms of the precedent already being set for a Russian naval excursion into the eastern half of the Mediterranean. However, when does Britain really become invested in this time? Because during this period, the 1760s and 1770s, Britain was not in a position to check Russian power. Britain was not the maritime hegemon that it arrived at after the Napoleonic period. It was France that was interested in checking this. Again, drawing back to historical parallels, and again, these are historical parallels that would be directly invoked by Napoleon III to justify his expansionist policy vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire. But Britain really begins to enter into this sort of Ottoman sphere with the Battle of the Nile, with um, their incursions into Cyprus and their prevention of Napoleon annexing Egypt. Um, which ultimately sort of ends in disaster and Napoleon has to abandon his army. And of course, the British establish themselves in Malta at the same time. Um, however, as this pertains to the Ottoman Empire, in 1809, France is at war with Britain. It, should be, it shouldn't be forgotten. After Tilsit, France has formed an alliance with Russia and Russia has entered the continental system. Russia is also pursuing a war with the Ottoman Empire. So from the British point of view, the British who have recently entered into the sphere of influence, you're now seeing a expansionist Russian Empire, which could presumably had Napoleon any intention of allowing Alexander to fulfill his dreams of taking Constantinople, have gained a very firm footing in the Mediterranean. And so Britain gravitates towards the Ottoman Empire in 1809 to conclude a treaty to deny Russian ships access through the Straits. And this is where we get back to a point which we came up earlier in Columba, I've, I've asked you to sort of delay up until this point, which is the relation between the Egyptian Mehmet Ali and the Sublime Port. Because what, what really needs to be emphasized here is this, after the Greek War of Independence, 
the Ottoman Empire and the Battle of Navarino, the Ottoman Empire has ceased to be a sovereign nation in any meaningful sense. It is no longer a great power, albeit it's given superficial affectations to assume the power, the position of a great power. However, it really is not a great power. Its international standing and its foreign policy is determined by other powers. Now, what is very effective about Nicholas's foreign policy during this time, and by extension, Kessel Road, who was the foreign minister, is that the Russians are interested in preserving a weak and effectively broken Ottoman Empire with which they can control indirectly. And probably the best example of this is the Treaty of the Royal Pier in 1838, after the Russians had helped defeat Mehmed Ali and drive him from Constantinople, because this gives the Russians effective access to determine who enters the Black Sea and who not to enter the Black Sea, and also to enable Russian ships to go through the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus Straits. And this effectively is a quid pro quo of an alliance, of an effective alliance between the Ottomans and the Russians. And to confirm this alliance, the following year, Mehmed Ali, again, feeling aggrieved that he hasn't got what he wanted out of the original settlement with the Sultan and wanting to have his position as the uh, Khedive or the Wali of Egypt confirmed as a king or a Sultan in his own right, declares another war. And this war is effectively pitting all these various powers against each other. France supports their vassal in Egypt, but Russia and Britain support this weakened, broken Ottoman Empire to prevent the creation of a, you know, a, a effective and powerful Mehmed Ali dynasty. And this goes so badly for Mehmed Ali that he actually has to cede territory back to the Ottoman Empire. Egypt had, for a brief amount of time, gained control over parts of Anatolia, the Holy Land, and Syria. And with this treaty, all of that territory is now lost and given back to the Ottoman Empire. And Egypt thereafter establishes its position around the Sinai Peninsula as the border between with the rest of the um, Ottoman Empire. So this is significant because superficially, it actually looks like the Russians have won. They have confirmed their position as the de facto sort of overlord of the Ottoman Empire through the establishment of the protection of the Christian, of the Christian subjects within the empire. And they have also prevented the French from using the Egyptians as a possible source of undermining of that Russian power. And fundamentally also, this has to do with the British also supporting the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire and by extension Russia at the same time. So how do we arrive from a position in 1840 where the Russians and the British and the Ottomans are all on the same side to 1853 where the British are at war with the Russians, or rather 1854 where the British are at war with the Russians because that seems like a fundamental step. And I believe this is the dramatic element of the great game in terms of this reversal. The great game has to be contextualized within this broader Cold War between Britain and the Russian Empire. And during the state of 1840, there is the Convention of London, whereby the British try and undermine all the privileges which have been given to Russia, especially in regards to the Dardanelles and the Bosporus Straits. At the same time, the British launch an economic offensive against the Ottoman Empire. They begin to heavily invest in the economic empire and basically submit the Ottomans to a state of basically diplomatic indentured servitude based on their economic and market penetration of the Ottoman system in a way that they would similarly try to do Britain with the Imperial Customs uh, Maritime Service in um, Qing Dynasty China at the same time. Now, if we look at this competition as a great power, you know, as a great power conflict, how can Britain decisively outcompete the Russians through access to trade, international finance, and market goods? Because Russia strategically is still bottled up within the sort of this vast Eurasian space, but Britain has the dominance in terms of being the facilitator of international trade. So Britain effectively buys. Ottoman influence to go from Russian influence over to British influence. Does that make sense? Indeed. And um, I just want to add something. Eh? Um, when I was making my notes for, um, with my research, I, I realised there was this some treaty that was signed in 18... Uh, I think it was around the same time or just after that other treaty that you mentioned. It's called um, Unkieskelesi, if I'm saying that right. But basically the Ottomans had to give significant land and naval access to the Russians at the exclusion of all other powers. So, <clears throat> so they're certainly pretty, pretty dominant. And then it's later revised with the Treaty of London in 1840, where um, 
they all have to agree to support the Ottomans against Mehmed Ali and the Russians sort of lose their privileged position. Indeed, we're seeing a major diplomatic back and forth regarding control over the Ottoman Empire. Sorry, there have been a plethora of bots in the chat, and uh, I was getting rid of bots so quickly, I actually got rid of one of my modders. Oh, <laughs> Lady, no. Of, oh, no. <laughs> Lady, Lady of Shalot. So um, I do apologize, Lady of Shalot, but you will be back in five minutes, and uh, I'll have to get rid of all the, uh, the bots from here on out, I'm afraid. Uh, there are so many at the moment. Yeah. So combine this. Britain is but, but waiting... Wasn't... But, but wasn't there also a sort of strange, because as you say, they're sort of establishing this economic dominance, but on the sort of um, PR front, there's this idea of sort of um, in Britain um, talking up and supporting the, the Ottomans. I think it's Palmerston who comes out and makes this statement that, you know, any talk of the Ottomans being a, a, a declining yeah, power more is, is nonsense. The man of Europe is nonsense. Yes, uh, but again, this is, this is something very effective about Palmerston's uh, rhetoric, is that Palmerston is brilliant at being able to mobilize the press to support his foreign policy wishes. From 1830 up until the late 1840s, which is this time, I mean, Palmerston, as far as I'm concerned, is prime minister into the late 1840s, which means he is responsible for this anti-Russian direction post the Convention of London, um, is responsible for, as you mentioned, pushing up the sort of international profile of the Ottoman Empire to win favor with the sublime port yeah. and to detract them from the Russians at the same time. And, and, the, um, is... and the, the Ottoman um, envoy in London is sort of fated as a hero um, regarding the sort of um, the demands of the Russians as well. So uh... Yes, and the, the, this, this is fundamentally where we get the narrative of Russian aggression. It's a relic, you can say, of Palmerston's effective PR campaign against the Russians in terms of trying to win over the Ottomans from the British. But it's not just the British who are important in this picture, because I mentioned Napoleon III, I've got a picture of, 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 of him on the right. Um, this is the moment where it is the combination of Napoleon III and the provision of the French army to the British cause, combined with Britain's maritime supremacy, which fundamentally opens up new options for the British to pursue their campaign for dominance and influence over the Ottoman Empire vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. And as an extension of this Bonapartesque uh, foreign policy, uh, which, which I've alluded to, France decided that one of a very sort of quick way of bolstering Napoleon's support among the Catholic population was to declare the French interest of protecting Catholics within the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Catholic Millet, or basically also uh, the, rent, the French protection of the Palestine as well. To this day, there are elements of Palestine which uh, the French declare as sovereign mm -hmm. territory due to these old treaties. And in terms of defending this policy, Napoleon III was basing this on very old precedents, which dated back to the era, um, which dated back to the era uh, when France was courting the Ottomans to oppose Russia during that original expansion. And again, this doesn't start off with Russian expansion. Rather, this starts off with French expansion. The French send a gunboat called Charlemagne to the Straits in order to try and press the Ottoman port into renegotiating the state of the protection of Christians within the empire. And they basically sort of agree under duress, don't they? Yes, and the, the, basically the, the Ottomans agree under duress to this gunboat diplomacy, which of course horrifies the Russians because this is seen as a dramatic about turn in terms of what they had basically considered their sphere of influence up until then. Um, have you ever played, I'm going to use like a bait, like a poor comparison, but have you ever you played uh, Victoria 2? Oh, the, I uh, have, yeah. Paradox game. Well, do you remember there's an event, I, I think, where, uh, you know, you have spheres of influence within that game. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then all of a sudden you get an event saying, you know, uh, oh, your, your ambassador has been cast out. And oh, you yeah. have the option, buy Jingo. <laughs> we're, going <to> go there. <laughs> we're going to go in there and we're going to restore our influence. Well, that is oh, effectively yeah. the Russian response to this <laughs> act of gunboat diplomacy on the part of the French. The Russians send a mission under Prince Alexander Menshikov to the port. And really, there's this intensification on the Russian side that what is our influence over the Ottoman Empire if it can be dispensed at so easily with the presentation of a French gunboat towards the Straits? So the Russian position is, OK, we need to confirm the protection of Christians, as is our treaty stipulation since 1774 but we need it confirmed 
to a greater extent than just relying on you to fulfill your international obligations because you've proven you can't do that. Yeah, it's basically they want a protectorate now, don't they? Yes, and the idea, interestingly enough, Marcus, is the restoration in some way of the military room, with the exception that this protectorate within the Ottoman Empire would no doubt have a Russian plenipotentiary or a Russian advisor there on the ground supervising the protection of the Christians. And given what happens within the Ottoman Empire, I actually think the proposal would be quite a sound one. Um, but nevertheless, um, this, rather than de-escalating the situation, doesn't de-escalate the situation, it intensifies it, because Britain and France at the same time are concluding that their interests against Russian influence in the Ottoman Empire are one and the same. And mm. British influence and diplomatic pressure in the court, especially under uh, uh, Sir Redcliffe and uh, Lord Aberdeen, who will later in 1852 uh, become Prime Minister of Great Britain, urges the Russian, urges the Ottoman court to resist all Russian proposals for the creation of a protectorate within the empire. Indeed, Palmerston, who is not even the foreign secretary, he's the home secretary at this point, intensifies the conflict by saying we need to send a royal naval flotilla to support the French in their, effectively their uh, prosecution and trying to ward off Russian encroachments in the Straits. I, I hate to uh, I hate to um, uh, steer in this direction, but it's only a brief, brief analogy. But it's almost as if we've never seen uh, in history before the British sending telegrams and ambassadors to urge other countries to certain courses of action. Yes, this is this is, this is something which, again, you may or may not be able to find a uh, a reference to in terms of what's going on today. <laughs> uh, but ne nevertheless, the oh, the I actually, actually, I was, I was funnily enough, I was thinking Poland thirty nine. But yes, yeah, uh, very true for the present extremity as well. The, the, yeah. the history is replete of them, but none of us know which one we're actually talking about. There's so many. But yes, we were talking about economic political and military yes. lobbying of one power to act yes. in the interest of another foreign power who just happens yes. to be britain on the one side and russia on the other Indeed. um so again how how do you respond in the situation now you know the ottoman court is not going to uphold its treaty obligations well the british and the french have responded with a flotilla so the russians respond with an escalation in the military conflict and they occupy the danubian principalities again the the czar operating under a legal pretext that he is the protector of the Danubian principalities. Effectively, it's under pseudo-Russian Ottoman sovereignty, these territories. And just to point out that these Danubian principalities, Wallachia and Moldavia, have been routinely occupied by the Russians over the last 60 years. Indeed, after the first war we mentioned in the stream between 27 and 29, the Danubian principalities were occupied as part of the indemnity agreement with the Ottoman Empire after that war. So Russian occupation of these territories is not something unprecedented or new, but it does <coughs> give the British a pretext to effectively, again, escalate the conflict that much further. And this is just a, a little note from uh, Mikhail Pogodin, who is a, uh, a Russian historian who talks about, again, this idea of using the Danubian principalities as a pretext to basically claim that the Russia is the aggressor. But can you if just make you, a point, because I need to cough for a second. So just... Oh, I'm just going to say, um, uh, I, oh, Hitman, go, and then I'll, I'll go. You, you, okay. you proceed. Okay, well, one point I wanted to make before we drift too far away is, um, again, during my research, I came across um, when the Tsar was, I think it was Palmerston he was talking to, um, but essentially he made the suggestion to actually Britain and Russia to carve up the Ottoman Empire, with Britain getting, I think, Crete and Egypt, and Russia getting their share. And the British are so disgusted by this, they can't believe it. And I, I don't blame them, it's crazy. Uh, blame the British. Um, well, but again, uh, I, I don't believe that the proposal is necessarily that ridiculous. I mean, um, Crete had already been in the offing in terms of negotiations over Greek independence. Crete was not stably under the control of the Ottoman Empire, and indeed as a prelude to the later conflict, there is going to be a rebellion in Crete. And when we're talking about Egyptian influence, what the Tsar is simply proposing is something the British would eventually do, <laughs> which is well, confirm their control in Egypt and occupy it in the beginning of the 1880s. So well, if anything, the Tsar was able to adequately discern British interests. But of course, the British had no interest in offering concessions. They wanted total victory, which um, comes to, again, this point by Pocketham. Yeah. France takes uh, Algeria. Uh, uh, 
Oh, sorry. I, I, I am. No, no. no, no well, I was just going to say again, another instance of where the, the British have never ever done that before in history. Um, but I just wanted to say, if you want to raise your voice, do you want me to read the excerpt? Because if it's about the um, if it's about the France takes Algeria point, I'll read the paragraph yes, for you just to save your voice. Yeah, thank you. Okay. No, no, you're welcome. France takes Algeria from Turkey, and almost every year, England England annexes another Indian principality. Oh, None can of this I just disturbed. explain that? This is sure. under the doctrine of lapse. And this is very correct in terms of Pogodin's point, because this causes so much uproar in India that <laughs> two years after the Crimean War, we have the Indian mutiny. So it's a valid point. Mm. Okay, indeed. Um, uh, England annexes another Indian principality. None of this disturbs the balance of power. But when Russia occupies Moldav Moldavia and Wallachia, albeit only temporarily, that disturbs the balance of power. France occupies Rome and stays there for several, year, several years during peacetime. That is nothing. But Russia only thinks of occupying Constantinople, and the peace of Europe is threatened. The English declare war on the Chinese, who have, it seems, offended them. No one has the right to intervene. But Russia is obliged to ask Europe for permission if it quarrels with its neighbour. England threatens Greece to support the false claims of a miserable someone and burns his fleet <laughs> that is a lawful action but russia demands a treaty to protect millions of christians and that is deemed to strengthen its position in the east at the expense of the balance of power we can expect nothing from the west but blind hatred and malice and Nicholas ratifies that point indeed. Um, but, but again, I'm sorry, I, Nicholas does have a point. And but again, we're talking about great power compensation and jockeying for influence within this territory. And as I said, the Danubian principalities had been effectively under continuous Russian occupation. And what we're talking about is the conferment of effectively um, Ottoman vassal status, which effectively had been agreed back in 1774 due to the protection of Orthodox Christians. However, again, this doesn't lead directly to war. The powers convene at Vienna. And Russia even accepts a provisional treaty, which the Ottomans under British and French actually later forced them to reject, interestingly enough. Uh, ostensibly, it's due to um, possible interpretations in, as a result of the treaty. But the fact that I believe that this is due to British and French lobbying is the fact that when the Ottomans reject it, rather than renewing the uh, negotiations, again, against the Austrians and the Prussians and the Russians' desire to continue negotiations, the British and the French storm out and support the Ottomans. So for all intents and purposes, the Ottoman Empire and Russia is at war, and Britain and France is doing nothing to try and ameliorate the situation. And this leads to the Battle of Sinop, whereby the Russian Black Sea fleet effectively destroys the uh, naval squadron of the Ottoman Empire based in Sinop, and despite, again, this being, you can argue, an effective negotiating tactic in terms of basically saying, OK, well, the Ottoman Empire doesn't have a fleet to be able to defend itself in the Black Sea. Let's go back to let's go back to um, negotiation table. Instead, it is characterized in the Western media as a massacre, despite it being a military altercation. And again, despite it being completely in line with the fact that Russia and the Ottomans are effectively at war with one another. Um, and again, we don't talk about Navarino as being a massacre, do we, when the British destroy oh. the Ottoman fleet there? Um, so, and again, this is partly Palmerston's doing as well. So it is remarkable from my point how sort of every escalation, there are many sort of diplomatic overtures to resolve the conflict and restore an element of the status quo. But every single time, the British and the French walk away from negotiations and find a pretext to escalate the conflict. Yeah. While That's Russia, all... should be argued, is escalating the conflict, but again, takes two to tango effectively indeed um, just for the sake of the the conversation it's worth mentioning that for the russians actually battle of sinop is actually a a insofar that if you take the consequences and put them to one side the actual action itself is is quite successful um the russians in fact uh, attack uh, the 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 bay of, or the 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 port of Sinop, with six uh, six ships of the line, two frigates, three steamers, and I believe this might be the first action where the, the Russians use steamers, and steamers are actually used in sort of this part of the world, because obviously the other place where steamers are first being used is in the American Civil War, and um, and the Ottoman strength comparatively is uh, seven frigates, three corvettes, and two steamers. Now the Russians suffer, I think, 
you know, 40 odd killed and maybe 200, just slightly over 200 wounded. So the losses are quite minimal for the Russians, but the the Ottomans are absolutely eviscerated. Um, approximately 3,000 are, are, are killed and wounded of, in terms of military personnel. The, a frigate is sunk, a steamer is sunk. Six frigates um, are almost irreparable. They're, they're grounded along with three other corvettes and two shore batteries are destroyed in this action. So uh, in, in, in so far that I, I hate to use the word an opening salvo to the war the russians actually score a very decisive um wow. blow against the ottomans from the onset and this is as i said from a military technology standpoint because uh, i want to caveat because i mean sometimes uh people in the uh i mean 90 95 percent people wonderful but sometimes in the comments everyone thinks that we should be oracles and you know sometimes there are wars and battles that we are more or less familiar with and the crimean war is something i'm less familiar with but what is important to to outline here is that this is one of the wars alongside the civil war where we see a dramatic uh uh shall we say improvement in technology or at least the beginnings of that dramatic change from the napoleonic period we we see rifling we see telegraphs we see steamers this sort of stuff and um from the russian standpoint this initial action is actually very successful yeah. i think another another major addition is um shells shells come in for the first time explosive shells correct yeah yep so from this you can say effective media presentation of sinop as some sort of atrocity the Angli the Anglo-French alliance pushes up the stakes of this and declares an ultimatum. And as you will know, Marcus, according to Bismarck's sort of famous phrase, there's only one way to respond to an ultimatum, which is to send another one. No great power, respecting great power, even the Ottomans would ever accede to an ultimatum sent by two other powers, as again, over essentially what the Russians believe is their own direct sphere of influence and upholding their own treaty obligations. Nevertheless, the British and French do send a ultimatum for the Russians to get out of the Danubian principalities. And this forms the formal pretext to go to war. As for the actual Russian situation in the Danubian principalities, this is where we get to the moment of Austria's great betrayal, because Austria does not take Russia's side. We mentioned earlier that the Austrian Empire under Schwarzenberg and Franz Ferdinand had been preserved in part due to the decisive intervention of Tsar Nicholas some six years before. In response, Tsar Nicholas hadn't even expected Austria to be a co-belligerent, but simply retain its neutrality, something Prussia would do. In fact, you can argue that Prussia was actually responsible in ensuring the Austrians would remain non-belligerent. I believe Mussolini's turn of phrase is perhaps the best way to explain Austria during the state of the Crimean War. Not neutral, but not technically belligerent, so non-belligerent. Nevertheless, the Prussians actually placed soldiers in Silesia so as to give the Austrians the impression that they were prepared to intervene on either side so as to block them from entering into the war. Such was the deterioration in Austria's relations. And I believe from Austria's point of view, this was a very cynical ploy, which was... Uh, I've, I've, heard, I've heard of that Prussian deployment being referred to as a wedge, for, uh, like in a, in a literal as well as a metaphorical sense, because ha deploying Prussian force in Silesia that would actually demonstrate that they're willing to act at least you know on the surface level against either the russians or the austrians precisely it was a brilliant yeah. uh, diplomatic move actually under the influence of bismarck as he was Indeed. the european minute he was the uh, german confederation minister mm. during this time but why right. did the austrians act and indeed it was the austrian ultimatum that they would get involved in the war later in the year of 1854 and combined that with a few setbacks against the um the ottomans in wallachia that forced the russians to retreat entirely from the Danubian principalities, after which the Austrians occupied the Danubian principalities. Well, I believe this is consistent with what Napoleon III himself tried to do later, whereby by being neutral and threatening to engage on one side of the war, he believed he would gain territorial gain, make territorial gains without actually having to fire a shot. In the case of yeah. Austria, what, what, might of, say, what, what might I say? What might say? It's the attempt to get, attain leverage without cost, and often that becomes fraught because you know it's impossible to. It's almost impossible to gain without some kind of risk, and sadly yes. we see this in these kind of situations. Well, it gets the both results are disastrous for mm, Austria. Exactly. 
they don't gain control over Wallachia and um, Moldovia, thereby securing control over the entire eastern Danubian basin. Mm. As with Napoleon, that, that's the core central strategic aim for the Austrians at this point. Yeah. As for Napoleon, Napoleon believed that sitting out of the 1866 Austro-Prussian War would ensure that the Prussians would cede to him the Prussian Rhineland. Of course, he had miscalculated, believing the Prussians would how to fight a long war with the Austrians. So rather than forming an alliance with Austria, preventing this conflict from happening at all, or indeed fighting alongside the Austrians, he miscalculated the situation and gained nothing. And indeed, all he did was prove Prussia's standing before the eventual mm. Franco-Prussian War. Indeed. So in both situations, both Franz Josef and Napoleon III made the same disastrous mistake. And in the course of Austrian history, this destroys the Holy Alliance, and it can only be later resuscitated in some superficial facsimile with the Dry Kaiserbund, the Three Emperors League, which was never a very effective organizational unit to begin with and relied on the success of the Prussian-Russian alliance rather than Austria being anything more than an extension of that. All of a sudden, Austria and Russia, which had been the mainstays of Europe's political order from 1815 until 1854, are now mortal enemies, and they will continue to be enemies all the way up into the First World War, where there is a climactic clash between them. And in terms of the significance of this betrayal, I believe this is the reason why Austria was suddenly isolated when Napoleon III would try again in the same Bonapartist vein, aside with the Piedmontese and support the Italian unification wars in 1859, and in the same way that Russia would gravitate towards Prussia and by extension facilitate the Prussian war against Austria and indeed Prussian unification of Germany. That is how significant this major military miscalculation is on the part of the Austrians. And what do they gain from it? Nothing. Because after the war, Romania is conceived of as basically given independence as Moldova and Wallachia. The two principalities unite and they form the modern day state of Romania, which is independent from all powers. So Austria gains nothing from this conflict. Mm. I, I'm, and also um, another thing that happens during this war, which I found quite interesting and perhaps it'd be worth talking about, is that the, the Greeks are essentially stopped from um, exploiting the war in any way, right? The, all the ports in Greece are actually blocked, so they yes, can't move absolutely. any Absolutely. And this again sort of shows how the Greek War of Independence was such a bizarre moment in European history. So rife with contradictions because the British and the French and the Russians have supported it. Now the two powers are against each other. Greece is obviously anti-Ottoman in this situation, so they gravitate to Russia, the original protector of the Greeks, and they are completely surrounded by the British and the French and are blockaded by them. So the only way that the Greeks can support them is by sending the Greek legion to go off and support the Russians at Sevastopol, which doesn't help. Effectively, from this point on, the British and the French are able to demonstrate their logistical dominance. They gain access to the Black Sea, they defeat the Russian Navy, and they attack Russia itself and the linchpin of Russian power in the Black Sea and the ability to project power onto the Ottoman Empire, which is Crimea itself, and by laying siege to Sevastopol. However, around this time, we see the famous charge of the Light Brigade in the Battle of Balaclava. So just before you go, Columba, would you be able to talk about that famous military engagement? Well, sure. So um, um, the Battle of Balaclava, that's happening. Um, so you have the Siege of Sebastopol, and Balaclava is essentially, I think, to the south um, on the coast, and so the um, or near the coast. And so the goal um, um, of the Russians is essentially to try and um, uh, you know, cut off um, um, the, the besieging forces from being uh, supplied from the sea, as far as I understand it. Um, and during the battle, um, there is a, a, a miscommunication, essentially. The, uh, I think that Lord Raglan um, um, wants um, um, to secure um, artillery pieces which have been left, which are going to be left behind. And so he sends um, 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 Lord Cardigan, who's the commander of the, the Light Brigade, to, to go and seize them. But there is some sort of miscommunication. And it essentially ends up with um, the Light Brigade, which is 600 men. Um, charging down Balaclava Valley um, right into the into the um, into the Russian artillery, and it's just an absolute bloodbath, as you can imagine. I think, um, uh, and that's even with the help of the French. You have the French uh, chasseurs d'Afrique, who um, I think you know the sort of um, um, what would you say the the African cavalry, which I think came from um, um, Algeria, French Algeria, and they were uh, they managed to secure um, 
um, some of the Russian artillery pieces up on the heights above them. But even um, despite that, it was obviously a, a crippling loss for um, for the British um, forces. I think there was something like, yeah, 650. And by the end, it was something like only 130 men were left on their horses. Um, the rest were either um, wounded, killed, or had been thrown from their horses. And so it was terrible. But um, um, something that you see and that I wanted to bring up, um, um, uh, uh, you know, people talk about the Crimean War as, you know, um, one of the first modern wars. And funnily enough, people speak um, in the same vein of the civil war in America, which obviously is going on at a similar time, similar developments with rifling and all of this. But, uh, you know, a, a very important thing is is it's not just it's not just in that term of modern war, but it's also in, in terms of um, the media and the response to the charge of the light brigade. I mean, it, it causes an absolute sensation. I mean, the news, the news reaches Britain very quickly um, and it causes an absolute sensation so much so that um, Tennyson, who is the um, Alfred Lord Tennyson, who is the poet laureate in Britain at this point, writes his famous poem about the charge of the light brigade. Um, um, at this time only, and I think it's published only six weeks after the charge. Um, and then also you have um, the famous action of, I think it's the 93rd Highlanders um, during the Battle of Balaclava, um, where instead of forming a square, which would be the um, traditional response to a cavalry charge, they're being charged by the Russian cavalry, um, um, the commander who has confidence in the new British rifles orders the men to form a line instead. And the uh, a correspondent from the Times who is there famously describes it as the thin red line. And this becomes another huge sort of um, 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 point of sort of pride in, in, um, in, in you know, in the, in the British media and, and for the British people who are, who are absorbing all of this stuff. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of bring that up in the sort of um, the vein of sensationalism that comes through a lot of the Crimean War and which um, um, later on sort of um, um, transfers into, you know, a real sort of anti anti war movement in Britain once you know, sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the casualty numbers start coming through, which are absolutely horrific. I mean, I think, you know, the combined deaths um, on the Allied side. Um, mostly from disease and from you know the sort of ravages of winter. It's it's yeah, over a hundred. It's over it's over a hundred thousand. Sorry, cholera and dysentery. Cholera and dysentery. Yeah, and it's over a hundred thousand men. Mm. I mean, it, it really is horrific. Um, and, and then of course you also have, um, you know, the idealization of um, Florence Nightingale, which isn't you know to um um. Um, disparage her. I mean, she does do very good work, but you know, she's almost sainted in the uh, in the British media. You know, they talk about her as this sort of the angel with the lamp. You know, going through the um, um, go going through the ranks at night. And so, you know, it, it is all sort of subject to this um, um, very Victorian sort of uh, sentimentalism. And so, I suppose just before I go, if you like, I could read out um, Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade just to give you a sense of that sort of um, um, the mood that was prevailing. Fantastic. Absolutely. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Here we go. Um, and if you don't already know this poem as a Brit, then, you know, you're, you're, you're some sort of subversive. <laughs> <laughs> um, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the 600. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. And then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered stormed at with shot and shell while horse and hero fell they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell all that was left of them left of 600 <laughs>
when can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wondered. Honor the charge they made, honor the light brigade, noble 600. So there we go. That's Tennyson's classic, but it shows you, um, um, you know, the sort of hysteria and the mm -hmm. flights of fancy that the British had got themselves worked into. I suppose trying to um, salvage something there. Although it is interesting, um, you know, just before I go, I'd like to get your opinion on this because I was reading about the charge of the Light Brigade, and it does have this, of course, reputation. I mean, obviously, it's not, you know, it's not a successful action, but it has this reputation as um, just being. Um, you know, sort of absolutely useless. It served no purpose at all. Um, and I suppose that view was sort of only um, intensified after the public opinion really turned against the war. But, um, um, you know, apparently some recent reassessments of the charge um, have said that in the Battle of Balaclava, it actually, um, it actually helped sort of... Um, um, how would you say make Russian morale waver? You know, in the sense that you know, almost, almost I suppose a bit of you know, look what they're willing to do. Um, so, so what do you think about that? Do you have any sort of opinions on that? I think that's a a, a bit of fanciful revisionism. In the same mm. way that you can say the charge of the Scots Greys during Waterloo would have had the mm. similar effect on the French. Um, as for just general propaganda, I mean, obviously that wasn't felt by Lord Raglan himself because he immediately tried to disown himself from that association and blame it on his underlings. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the thing. Everybody started blaming each other in the press as well, didn't they? Exactly. Yeah. So the, the, preve the prevalent feeling is that this was a completely unnecessary loss. And yeah. But again, if anything, it sort of re-emphasizes the fact that Russian incompetence, you know, the mm. British were still able to win in Crimea, despite the fact of, you know, incompetence and cross orders and affairs like the charge of the light brigade but what this was successful in doing i would say is the opposite was in sapping the will to fight within the british chattering classes yeah. and given the fact that we're talking about the rise of liberal democracy in britain and later on in 1867 we're going to have the next uh, great reform act under the aegis of disraeli and really this is the beginning of war as a sensation and regular dispatches being you know available to the middle classes in britain yeah. um that i believe that had this been a conventional war it could have lasted much longer but because of the essentialized nature of it and because of the domestic opposition due to the ongoing nature of the war i believe that events like the charge of the light brigade actually if anything stymied the possible sort of severity of the defeat for russia yeah i suppose um the best view is, um, I think, the French marshal who was the, uh, he managed to observe the charge. I think he commented to his, um, you know, his sort of entourage um, afterwards. He said, uh, uh, magnifique, uh, mais, uh, uh, was it, mais, mais ce n'est pas la guerre. It's magnificent, um, but it's not war. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> c'est c'est de la folie. It is madness. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. And on that note, gentlemen, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. I, I'm sorry I couldn't have been more use, but um, the event sort of um forestalled my uh my preparing as I would have liked. But um, next time I'll be back and uh, um, on better form. I hope. Uh, no, thank you, Columbo, and uh, good night. All right, good night, good night gents. Good night, Columbo. Right, um, so. Sorry, Hitman, go ahead. Well, on that basis, can we talk a little bit about Lord Raglan? Uh, yes, absolutely, go ahead. Well, because obviously from what Columbus just said, um, he's got, obviously with the charge of the Light Brigade, you, most people's impression of him is that, oh, he's a fool and not a good commander. But from what I've been reading, I think he was quite an effective commander because um, during the Napoleonic Wars, I think he was, specifically the 100 Days Campaign, I think he was actually Wellington's um, aide de camp. So he was an experienced soldier. And also, from what I was reading during the whole course of the Crimean War, um, it seems to me that if he'd had more control, I think they may have actually won the war sooner, because there's two occasions when he wants to assault Sevastopol after the Russians have retreated, and the French sort of poo-poo that, and they sit and wait, and the Russians are able able to garrison the, the city. So if they listen to him, they may have taken it sooner. It is possible, and this is the difficulties associated with a multinational command and not just the French as well but also the Piedmontese would have a belated sort of entry into the war again almost uh, a uh, presaging what is going to happen with the after effects being this facilitation of the French Piedmontese alliance and Italian unification as a result of the great betrayal um, 
just just in terms of like an overall sort of sense of the war, obviously Sevastopol is the key in terms of the ability of Russia to project power to the Ottoman Empire, but they also uh, siege Taganrog, uh, which doesn't go so well. Sevastopol, uh, I believe, falls in October of 1855. And during that time, there are many attempts to try and re relieve the siege, one of the most decisive being the, uh, the Battle of Malakoff. Um, also during this time, in early 1855, during the siege of Sevastopol, Palmerston becomes prime minister. And despite the fact that the war would come to a conclusion soon, effectively after the fall of Sevastopol, Palmerston advocates for a continuation and indeed escalation of the conflict in contradiction to prevailing opinion with the view, again, as part of the great game, that the longer the conflict draws on, the more fronts Britain can establish against Russia and indeed impugn Russia in any way from acting as a not only as a aggressive great power, supposedly, but in many ways acting as a opponent to the increasingly sort of confident liberal democratic traditions of Great Britain at the same time. So it's important to note that even though this is called the Crimean War, there was also a Baltic theatre going on at the same time. And the British have occupied the Aland Islands, which now are between Finland and Sweden, but then were part of the Grand Duchy of uh, Finland, which was part of Russia, and had the war continued, it is likely that the British would have tried to storm Kronstadt and with the, the main uh, Russian naval installation in the Baltic. And had Kronstadt fallen, it is likely the British would have even tried to take St. Petersburg itself, which was the capital of Russia at that time. So it is possible, had the British again had more determination to fight, that they could have won an even more decisive victory. Because in the event, when we look at the outcome of the war, which is the Treaty of Paris, we see the creation of Romania, albeit the you know interim sort of creation of the principalities, and then the reunification, and the demilitarization of the Black Sea, which is the most disastrous Russian setback, because it again confounds all of the aspirations of Russian expansionism since the 1760s in terms of using the Black Sea as a definitively Russian sea. And indeed, after the Battle of Sinop, it looked as if Russia had essentially gained control over the Black Sea and through mm. the Black Sea was able to project power into the Mediterranean. But after this, Russia has the double humiliation of having that avenue for expansion stopped, but also in the fact that Britain and France are imposing this treaty not on a third-rate power, but on a great power in the form of the Russian Empire. And that is, in, in many sense, a double humiliation. The only sort of humiliation that Russia is able to avoid is a limited loss of physical territory, but the loss of prestige and the loss of Russia's aspirations, indeed, the loss of influence in the Ottoman Empire is far more decisive in terms, of, and of course, the loss of influence in the Danubian principalities is more than enough to have to be augmented with the loss of physical territories as well. The physical loss being southern Bessarabia. This is also a policy pursued by... Um, Nicholas II as well, after the Russo-Japanese War, which focused on a peace treaty without territorial concessions. And the end, he only has to cede South Sakhalin, which for the Japanese was so horrific that it actually caused riots when the uh, peace was uh, concluded with the Russians. But nevertheless, with Gorbachev having replaced Kessel Road as the, foreign, as the foreign minister of Russia, Russia is able to retain some face with such limited loss of physical territory. But again, the loss is psychic. The loss is in Russia's ability to act in this isolationist vein. The loss is in the fact that overall skepticism regarding the bureaucratic classes of Russia was correct. In particular, Alexander Menshikov, who was the overall commander before he was replaced by another Gorbachev, uh, had been completely incompetent in terms of the administration and Russian logistics had failed. Russia had been unable to, not only in the naval theater, but it had been unable to bring forth the full power of the Russian state in a way that, say, for example, had been able to defeat Napoleon um, only some 40 years before. And this is really where I want to get your sort of contribution, Marcus, because many people point to the lack of innovation and reforms from Nicholas as being responsible. Uh, he is responsible for the introduction of the railway into Russia. The first railway into Russia was created from St. Petersburg to Zaskoy Solo, the Tsar's village just outside of St. Petersburg. And later, mm. the railway was developed from St. Petersburg to Moscow. But by the end of uh, Nicholas dies during this time, he dies at the height of the war in 1855, along Uvarov will soon fall as well. Um, Russia doesn't have sufficient logistics, military logistics, to be able to integrate the Southern mm. Theater with Moscow. How decisive do you think that is in explaining why Russia lost? Well, I think one thing that's worth 
uh, take into account here is uh, in the last sort of century, obviously, particularly through the French Revolutionary period and throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the scale of battles has uh, have increased in size, and the and the amount of resources sort of mobilized for war uh, increase along with it. Not that these battles that we see in the Crimean War are much uh, are much different from, say, the Napoleonic period itself, but you're, we must take into account that what we have is a sort of a multinational allied force comprised primarily of the French, the British, and the, and the Ottomans fighting in Crimea against the Russians, and then later the Piedmontese, as you say, sort of have a bit of a, an appearance towards the end. And uh, we did touch on the fact that a lot of allied casualties uh, that were non-combat related were either men who succumbed, well, they were the men who succumbed to their wounds, but the vast majority of non-combat uh, injuries were in fact cholera and dysentery, uh, which would have reflected sanitation and sanitation to a large degree can be alleviated by ad adequate supply, which was a problem for the, for the allied forces in Crimea. And then on the, from the Russian standpoint is that if you look at where the, the sort of main hubs of, of Russian, uh, I, I hate, I hate to use the word infrastructure, but infrastructure was located more in the sort of northern and western periphery of the russian state the crimea as we've talked about in past streams were sort of re relatively recent acquisitions uh in sort of the prior hundred years or so of the of the of the czar state and so the ability of the russians to actually sort of develop these areas was handicapped likewise there was a greater priority for when sort of rail started to become, um, uh, how could I put this? I mean, ubiquitous was more a word you could use for the 19th century, but as the enthusiasm for rail increased and more and more track was laid down, it was obviously, like you say, prioritized for St. Petersburg, prioritized for Moscow. Um, I mean, we even see, if you even look at a rail map, for instance, of say the Second World War, because uh, you know, when you fast forward, you know, 100 years later, logistics is even of greater importance when you consider the volume of warfare. Um, the the three main hubs that are of most importance to to, to Russia are, or the Russian, or, or the Soviet Union then, but of the state are Leningrad, slash and Petersburg, Moscow, and Stalingrad or Volgograd. Even in the South, there is a, a, a lack of this infrastructure 100 years later. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, in terms of how that impacts the 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 efforts of war from a logistical standpoint and another thing to say about russia because we we did touch on before like the successes of of the russian forces in the napoleonic period and how sort of russia became the last great man standing in europe following napoleon's defeat on the continent as the russian army expands it doesn't actually increase in quality in fact one would argue that in fact diminishes in quality over time um if you look at the reforms that are forced through in Prussia by uh, Scharnhorst and Eisenhower and Clausewitz, the the German and and of course Germany is a bit of a different kettle of fish, sort of intellectually speaking and and uh, culturally speaking, and and likewise with Austria, um, there's you might say more of, a, of of an educational culture in the uh, within the armed forces. This doesn't exactly exist in Russia to the same degree. And of course, as they expand the size of the ground army or, or the, the land forces its quality does diminish somewhat. So you add these factors together, a lacking of logistic capacity, an expansion of the armed forces, a dilution in quality. Uh, I mean, we've got to think even World War I, Russia, uh, Russian forces were struggling in terms of just the, the literacy of of their soldiers, whereas the this is very boots. different. Oh, well, exactly. It's something as simple as the provision of boots just was lacking. And so when you look at these fundamental elements of the Russian army, it's in fact almost astonishing they performed as well in the Crimean War as what they did. I dare say that what might have um, thrown the Russians off was thinking that fighting on home ground is usually easier from a logistical standpoint. But mm. if the fundamentals aren't in place, the home ground advantage just isn't as as um, as profound as what it otherwise would be. And uh, uh, but one thing that's worth noticing is if you take a look, for instance, at the Battle of Alma, you take a you know a look at the the, the siege of Sevastopol, Sevastopol writ large in the context of obviously Malakoff and um, the assault on the Great Redan um, is, uh, you know, 
if the Russians lose, they're still inflicting qu quite comprehensive ca uh, casualties on the Allies. And off and and like you say, there was a, um, uh, a uh, uh, the Radan is a, is a, is a technical Russian victory. I can't remember the other Russian. You mentioned it when. Um, uh, what was the other battle you mentioned? Taganrog. Um, it wasn't a battle, yeah. but it was a prolonged siege. Again, it was more oh, a stalemate well, than anything but, else. But, but the ability of the Russians to stymie the Allied efforts is what I was more alluding to. Um, goes to show that the Russians don't are, are not a, are not useless. They're not you know, completely inept, but they have these frailties in their armed forces that just. Prevent I think what them I, I, I want to push back against just a little bit is mm. my my point isn't that Russia is militarily inept. My point is that Russia. Oh, I'm not. I'm not saying not, that you said. Yeah, that. My, my my point is that Russia is not a great power of the first rank, as everyone no, had anticipated. No. It, it or, is or, not or, the continental yeah. military superpower. And or, 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 or what's worth probably its own turf, which is at that yes. point was almost seen as unthinkable. It's probably worth saying that a modern army of what you call a first rate power that has a first rate army. I hate to sound exceedingly materialistic about this, but has to have a first world economy to back it up, which is why I think, for example, when you, when you look at the effects of German unification and how the German army expands thereafter and the ability to for the German, uh, the German Empire to outfit a professional, strong, well-equipped army, those things exist in unison they sort of coexist you have this you know a, a well-educated society with a strong officer corps with a you know strong industrial base uh you know it's well resourced well fitted out and those things come together to form a strong army that is not just superficially large on paper but has has depth and has quality um this doesn't exist in russian like you say it's it's sort of on paper a a strong army saying nominal strength but when they're lacking boots and they're lacking provisions and you know even like the quality of the small arms aren't that good like for instance you know in this war here the, the british and the french actually have a firepower advantage um vis, -vis the the russians uh, all these little points add up and when you sort of do the calculus at the end it leads to the fact the russians simply can't prevail despite them fighting on home home ground i think the decisive advantage of the allies is the maritime advantage though in of the course. same way in the same way because remember the russians were untouchable during the late 18th century because of the relative power of russia vis-a-vis -vis britain and france so the irony is that despite 1812 despite the victory of napoleon Britain and France have actually increased in power relative to that of Russia, and they are able collectively to project power on a European and, and indeed uh, world stage. Britain has just mm -hmm. won a victory against Qing China. The Americans even, under Commodore Perry, are just going to force uh, Tokugawa era Japan to open up to the rest of the world. And comparatively, mm -hmm. Russia's maritime lack, despite the emphasis which has been placed on the strong navy since Peter the Great and Alexei Orlov, Gregory Potemkin, in spite of all of this, mm -hmm. Imperial Russia, to my mind, has never been a first-rate naval power. And just to emphasize this and the opening up of Japan, nothing has demonstrated this more than the annihilation of the Baltic fleet at the Straits of Tsushima and the dismal performance of the Russian Navy, again, as repeated here, the fact that they lose. Mm -hmm. In the, again, Britain is projecting power into Russia's own local Malinostrum, into the mm -hmm. Black Sea and into the Baltic Sea. And the fact that Russia is unable to defeat the British and the French flotillas within their own sort of, again, remit, and again, are mm -hmm. forced to demilitarize their zone. It's not just the demilitar demilitarization of the Black Sea, but even the demolishing of the fortress of Sevastopol. All of these things are yeah. humiliations to the Russians uh, it, and their ability to project just... power outward. Uh, yeah, well, another point I wanted to add is um, actually during the course of the war, um, when Sevastopol is under siege, the Russians actually scupper their fleet and use the cannons to reinforce the, yeah. the fortress. Yes, it, it facilitates which, the destruction of the navy. But again, it demonstrates which, the, yeah, the which is a, which is a measure they would echo in the in yeah. the uh, in a in a later conflict, nearly hundred years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But but again, you yeah. can say that Stalin was far less ambitious towards the Republic of Turkey, given his uh, de Indeed. demonstration of sort of friendly, net friendly relations uh, with that. So, I was yeah. merely reflecting on on um, on the Russian propensity for pra pragmatism or military pragmatism. Um, wh what I did want to say as well uh, uh, on on this basis is because we we did talk about well, the poem that Columba kindly cited for us, Balaclava. Uh, 
because we've often spoken about um actually funnily enough like we're talking about armenian ca cavalry and you know often when you get to this time period the cavalry has this knack of sticking its head up you know because we obviously talked about the usage of cavalry in the in in the in with the stream we talked about um you know the rise of prussia and their brother war with austria and then uh, the franco-prussian war of 71 and how sort of it had utility but it, it was quite a situational um the, the charge of the light brigade shows or demonstrates this vulnerability of cavalry you th you, if one thinks of the fact that it's man on horse and it's a large target even though it is relatively swift moving um you know particularly in this point too where firepower is intensifying rifles uh becoming uh, ubiquitous which makes them more accurate they can fire from f farther ranges gives them chances to reload um you know we're on the cusp of breach loading technology which makes reloading easier both for artillery and for small arms and um and the fact that the russians were able to or oh, i suppose this is more of a, 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 a indicative of the confused orders and a bit of british ineptitude here but the fact that the russians were able to pour enfilading fire on them from essentially three directions um and the cannons themselves were defilated uh, on a on a on a on a rise so i'm trying to think of the name of the hill where they were deployed on um it just doesn't oh, I, think, look like... I think i've got it it's um it's got a french name the thing hang on uh so i'm just trying to find it once my notes no 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 no. you're fine you're fine um uh yeah i've just gone blank but yeah anyway um it's, you know it's, it's very marcus um, i mean if it's possible because it's already two hours and half an hour stream in oh no no <laughs> I, I, I i'm nearly finished the point i'll forget the forget the hill doesn't matter but the point yeah. i'm making is that you know the russians are pouring fire from three separate directions upon uh upon the british sort of charged light brigade and they are they are essentially massacred they're, they're just they're just they're eviscerated by this hail of fire and you know and, and the artillery is using um you know uh different types of charges like columbus said the, the the use of shells is starting to come into play which increases the destructive power of artillery quite substantially and we will see this over the next sort of you know 20 years 50 years leading up to world war one where sort of artillery will be taken to its absolute you know pinnacle of 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 saturation certainly for the for, for those uh, if, if, for those who lived at the time to have conceived of such firepower would have been uh, amazing and so almost in my mind the charge of light brigade should have almost been the beginning of the end for cavalry should have been the death knell but because of these other situational instances where cavalry was was used to success say in the franco-prussian war say in the austrian uh, uh, prussian war cavalry actually gets given a lifeline to the fact that it's still used on battlefields in world war one and then when the lethality index over the next 50 years has increased again with the use of machine guns and and um rifles you know bolt action rifles with magazines and what have you uh cavalry is is i mean i know we see cavalry units sort of live on into world war ii but they're used more for rear echelon duties and not exactly used in a military standpoint aside from a few instances but um the light brigade is really a turning point where we start to see uh cavalry's deficiencies showing itself in the face of modern military technology thank you marcus i really have to rush on and very quickly summarize the consequences i mean mm. if it weren't for my voice i'd be happy to continue going on but really no no, no. Uh, and also and also because i've done two mornings in the row i'm actually quite tired so um on that will, note, do you want do you want to bail or do you want me to hang oh around? my no you'll have to stay <laughs> you can't do <laughs> okay. better than bail no no i i've got okay. a I have to finish the okay. narrative arc of this. I can't just leave All now. Right. It's called the right. and consequences. I, I, I will stay. I'll stay with you then. Um, if you're going to be, yeah, if we've got to wind it up, I'll stay. But uh, no, I, I have to get through this, unfortunately, because this is a series of streams. So Alexander II is often characterized as the Tsar liberator and indeed a westernizer and a liberal reformer. He's mainly known for the Emancipation Edict, which gives in 1863, which gives 1861 rather, which gives 23 million serfs again property and commercial rights for the first time. However, it is done in a way where the government provides substantial loans, and indeed the whole system is the serfs will effectively have to buy their freedom over a long period of time to the point that it's a system of redemption payments which in many ways last up to 49 years so it's a very conservative way of again trying to as 
Uvarov was saying, reform the system without breaking the fundamental foundation of the system. And again, this is made possible by the fact that so many of Russia's nobility have been placed into massive amount of debt over such a long period of time. And so they actually welcome the ability to sell off their serves through the system of redemption payments. Um, he's most, again, famous for this reform. But again, I view this very much in continuation of the reforms of Alexander I, who abolished the system of slavery, a system of serfdom in Livonia. And I don't really consider Alexander to be that much of a liberal, especially when it comes to nationalization policy and expansionism. In some way, I view Alexander II as, again, utilizing this reform as a fundamental remedy, not because of any fundamentally sort of liberal desire to bring about these reforms to make Russia more liberal, but to make Russia more efficient and more effective vis-a-vis -vis the West. And in foreign policy, with Nicholas I, we see, you can say, the willingness to collaborate with foreign powers to uphold the concert of Europe. And you can say tentative, anxious cooperation with the British up until the Crimean War, where such a possibility is shown to be demonstrably false. With Alexander II, we see pragmatic and effective policies aimed at turning the tide of the great game and allowing Russia to make real tangible gains whilst confronting Britain as effectively the major antagonist of Russian foreign policy. In a sense, he is a Hadrian, um, retreating and consolidating Russia's position in more dubious backwaters. So he is responsible for the selling off of the Russian colony of Alaska during the 1860s. And he does so to the Americans rather than ceding the territory to the British um, in Canada, again, to try and forestall any sort of British attempt to gain access and control of the Bering Straits and possibly lead a naval expedition to Colmio, as counterproductive and ridiculous as that might sound, it was nevertheless a strategic possibility. At the same time, Alexander II is responsible for a much greater expansion of the physical territory within Eurasia compared to his predecessor, Nicholas I, who again was very much consolidating previously established gains under Catherine the Great and Alexander I. With Alexander II, we see the subjugation of the Khanate of Kiva. We see the conquest of the Emirate of Bukhara. And by the 1870s, Russia has established itself with what would see its Soviet borders and Russian imperial borders at the borders of Afghanistan and Persia. And indeed, Russia is beginning to put pressure on Afghanistan and Persia to such an extent that Britain is reviving these fears, which have been stipulated since Paul I, about a Russian invasion of India. And again, Paul's idea was the utilization of Cossacks. <laughs> so this is all very significant in terms of these broad sort of strokes to sort of modernize and effectively utilize Russia, but also of the strength of the British and indeed the French intervention in the two opium wars between 1840 and 1860, <coughs> again, following a very similar policy, which Nicholas I iterated with the Greek War of Independence, uh, the Russians issue an ultimatum to, Ch to uh, Qing Dynasty China to cede a large territory of outer Manchuria to the Russians. And the, Rus the Qing Dynasty China gives these territories up without a fight. And this territory of Primori later becomes the basis of Russian expansion into Manchuria and the creation of Vladivostok, which literally means ruler of the East. And if anything, it's demonstrative of Alexander II's imperial ambitions in this territory. So that's the physical expansion of the Russian Empire at the potential expense and even riding off the, uh, the coattails of the British. On the other hand, I wanted to bring up Uvarov and orthodoxy and nationality, uh, what, sorry, uh, orthodoxy, orthodoxy and nationality, because we see the increasing process of Russification. During his early, um, early reign in 1863, we see another sort of extension of the great game, which is the 1863 Polish-Lithuanian rising, which at one point looked as if it could have potentially restored the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And it is crushed by Alexander, not without the support of France and Britain, who support the Polish and Lithuanians. And again, if anything, this makes any sort of possibility of the Russians sympathizing with Napoleon III on the eve of German unification all that more impossible, because Napoleon III and Britain are still trying to undermine and use Poland and Lithuania and the nationality question to undermine Russia and, as Palmerston so 
brilliantly sort of indicated a view of British foreign policy to enfeeble Russia so it can't project power outwards. If anything, Alexander II is successful in being able to make a nonsense of that idea, which is why I think it's important to understand Alexander II as a response and a consequence of the Crimean War rather than a dramatically liberal turn. And again, when we look at the liberal reforms themselves, we can say, for example, the creation of the Zemspo, the local governments, or the implementation of a French style of a French style judicial system, but of course not as something as radical as introduction of common law, because there is a fundamental element of lacking a presumption of innocence in French courts. And also um, the power of, say, for example, even Jews to um, uh, access you know, formal state employment. And indeed, we talked about an element of Uvarov. Whilst he wanted to create academic levies, there was a fundamental phobia within the Russian bureaucratic core of allowing former peasants and the middle classes to enter into Russian bureaucratic service. This had been, you know, offered on exception, including Speransky. However, with the creation of a university reform system uh, under Dmitry, um, who would later be organized under Dmitry Tolstoy, there was an attempt to try and bring more people from the lower orders into service in the Russian table, effectively before with the table of ranks and the privileges granted to the nobility. This has been something incomprehensible. But again, I view this less in terms of a desire to genuinely introduce liberal reforms, rather that this is seen as a necessary tonic to bring more talent to augment effectively the lack of competence among the nobility, which had been demonstrated through the Crimean War. However, again, to demonstrate, however, that this is very much reforms in the leash, when there is an attempted assassination attempt of the education minister, there is a direct limitation placed on what is allowed to be taught and who is allowed to attend university. So what is consistent with Alexander is that he's prepared to offer reforms when he's when he receives loyalty, but to punish and persecute when he is faced with rebellion. So on the one hand, we look at Polish independence. With Polish independence, any vestige of constitutional independence of Poland is wiped from the constitutional settlement, which had been afforded with 1815. Similarly, language provision in Polish, Lithuanian, and indeed Belarusian is revoked through a series of ukatses, edicts. However, the Finns had proven their loyalty to Russia during this time. So whereas Poland and Lithuania had their privileges revoked, Finland was given more provisions for freedom and autonomy within the Russian state system at this time. And the UCAS didn't just extend to the creation of, you know, subjugating Poland and Lithuania, but indeed in terms of trying to douse Ukrainian nationalism at the same time, we're seeing the genesis of a Ukrainian national identity. Um, and again, this is, if anything, one of the extensions of the Slavophile and Pan-Slavic philosophies, um, people who are wanting to unify all the various communities of Slavs within not just Russia but beyond uh, using more sort of democratic pretexts. So if we look at Kostomarov um, and the uh, Brotherhood of St. Cyril and Methodius, we see a lot of sort of romanticism assigned with Cossack anarchy, Marcus, and appealing to the Cossack lifestyle as an alternative to Uvarov's triad of autocracy, and orthodoxy wedded to nationality. Instead, we're looking to the Narodniks, um, forms of agrarian populism and local collectivism, small democratic movements based on Slavophile philosophies, opposed to the overall control of the Tsar. And what Alexander mm -hmm. II is rather explicit in all of his provisions is that autocracy is the fundamental component of all of his reforms, reforming from above so as to prevent reform from below. And mm. this also comes down in terms of you know, crushing the Holodmas, the revival of these traditional peasant assemblies, and indeed coming down on the Ukrainian language as an extension of the UCAS. And mm. this leads to a huge exodus of pan-Slavists and, you know, anti-sort um, anti of imperialists away from Russia. And indeed they're received in Galicia, in Austrian Poland, which then becomes a node of subversion and the chrysalis of Ukrainian nationalism at the same time. So domestically, we're seeing a implicit rejection of the more democratic aspirations of the pan-Slavists. And again, what Uvarov was talking about at the beginning and why I was so anxious to discuss this, which is the ability of nationalism to, le to level the playing field and to 
chip away at the fundamental hierarchy. And in this sense, Alexander II is counteracting this policy by focusing on explicitly Russian nationalism, as opposed to trying to collectively inculcate all the various nationalities within the Russian empire, because Russian mm. speakers only make up about half of the total population of the Russian empire. It is dominant, but it is not overwhelmingly dominant. And mm. this really should or be- in, or, or in such a case, barely constitutes a majority in this <laughs> Absolutely. Um, mm. So that is my just brief introduction to Alexander II and mm. reviewing the consequences of the Crimean War and what their effect were domestically on Russia. And of course, a consequence of this also is the promulgation of universal conscription in 1874. And you can say this, if anything, fundamentally, we talked about the abolition of serfdom. Well, universal conscription as determined by the state, removing the landowner's role in drafting serfs, which had been the previous uh, prescription. So what we see is a fundamental elimination of powers of the ability to levy armies, the ability of the serfs themselves to organize popular resistance and to centralize control in the Russian army and in the figure of the Russians are. So I can't help but feel that in many ways, um, he is actually extolling many of Uvarov's aims in terms of taking aspects of westernization, which would aid and abet and facilitate the cementing and centralization of Russian autocracy, while keeping a leash on the more radical implications of these ideas. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I do. Um, it, it, I mean, I know these situations aren't exactly comparable, but it's a little bit, it does remind me a little bit of um, when uh, when German unification was completed um, after 1871, when uh, Bismarck basically was the progenitor of the German welfare state, and uh, I, I know you you joked um, uh, about us uh, how we're both uh, full of Eagles fans, but um, whether he, this is a verbatim quote or not, but you know he he sort of says jokingly to our uh, to um to Holstein, you know uh, these reforms will take the wind out of the sails of the socialists. I get the idea that this uh, this idea of reform top, uh, from the top down rather from the bottom up is sort of a Russian uh, uh, a, a Russian um uh, a, a equivalent of. With the exception that the state here is far less expansive. And absolutely, is, absolutely. And focused on military reform principally yes. and of trying to recontextualize the relationship between mm. the lower orders and the nobility with that of the Russians. Oh, I, I appreciate there's, there's obviously comprehensive differences, but I mean, just like the overall ethos of the, the philosophy of, you know, doing a top down rather than letting yeah, it happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, albeit know, there's, I'll there's say, I, I think it's important to understand that, you know, Bismarck's reforms are far more radical in terms of their oh, lasting implications. Doubtless, so. doubtless. And also in terms of, like, say scale and and everything is the the what occurred in germany was far more um uh, profound in almost every conceivable way and, and again i don't look at the emancipation of the serfs as some sort of heroic or idealistic act rather i see alexander was able to achieve something which many of his predecessors had tried and failed to achieve or only mm. achieve in, in an incremental way. Yes. So, so again, I feel that Russian reform, you know, going back to Alexander I and his uh, state council constitutional reforms, the attempts to reform the Russian administration, even, you know, the responses to the Pugachev rebellion during the reign of Catherine the Great. Um, if anything, I believe there's a certain tautology, uh, which links this all the way back to the emancipation of the serfs and it should be as no surprise that it took only five years after the conclusion of the crimean war for alexander ii to attempt to again forestall potential discontent and the ability for foreign powers to use the condition of the serfs to augment discontent within russia by taking that power out of their hands and centralizing authority under the czar so if, if anything i have quite a you know a, a sort of weary respect for Alexander II, especially in terms of his ability to project and in many ways show the radical disposition of Russian foreign policy and the ability to reverse elements of the Crimean situation which had been imposed upon him, which is through the Eastern Question Revisited. Now, this is where I hope to have 
uh, Columbus input. But just to briefly summarize, I've talked a bit about pan-Slavism domestically and how the Slavophiles were of mixed persuasion. It's erroneous in my view to distinguish between Slavophiles and Westerners because they overlap considerably. This, of course, unfortunately, is a modern map. As, as much as I tried for the stream, I actually couldn't find a ethnic, grap, uh, ethnic map which pertained to the era of uh, Alexander II. Um, I'm sure there is one out there and I could have spent hours looking for it. But just for reference, just don't look at Poland, especially when I <laughs> because uh, it's going to be very confusing but just look at the south and the area around Romania during eight um after the Ottoman Empire sort of um accepted the new situation post Crimea it was tentatively tentatively brought back into the world of great power politics however as always its real independence was quickly proven to be a nonsense and the French were able to utilize their new position as protectors of, of, Christen, of Christians within the Ottoman Empire by leading a expedition to Syria between 1860 and 1864. Uh, it was protectors of, the, of, of Catholics of the Levant, wasn't that the, the claim, and, and, more and or, and or less? Indeed, and indeed the Mennonites and the Mennonite yes. Christians and French That's and right. the yeah. creation of Lebanon. This, this has mm. a very long history which really starts around the time of... Uh, this period and sort of echoes throughout uh, for the next century, really, in terms of the, mm. the French uh, creation of the state of Lebanon as a state yeah. for the Mennonites. But mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, my, my illustration here is that the Ottoman Empire were not sovereign. And this wasn't a situation which, you know, the Ottoman Empire couldn't project power in a way to meaningfully sort of reel in their rebellious elements without some form of great power intervention. And mm -hmm. during 1875, there is the beginning of a general revolution against the Ottomans in their uh, Balkan provinces. There is a revolution in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there is a revolution in Bulgaria. And so whilst Pan-Slavism is to a degree being repressed domestically, um, there is already within the communities of the Ottoman Empire, now that the military room has collapsed and Greek independence is an established thing, even Serb independence de facto has already been established at this point, there is a natural momentum among the Slavic communities to result against the Ottoman Empire. And this is something I'll go into later on the, uh, the following mm. discussion. But needless yeah. to say, as this pertains to the Russians, from 1875 until 1877, the Ottoman Empire persecutes a war against the local population using irregular troops, Bashi bazooks, Bashi bazooks, to such an extent that it causes an international outcry, similar to that what we see with the Greeks, which precipitated an international response. Indeed, Gladstone uses this as an opportunity to write an admonition towards the apathy, the moral apathy of Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister from 1874 until 1880, for refusing to intervene on part of the Balkan peoples. However, this is why I would say that Russia was able to get its own back for the Crimean War by being able to, unlike what we see with the British and the claims of Russian expansionism, effectively exploit public opinion in the West to ride on that to ride on that uh, tidal wave of uh, popular support for the Balkan populations and use the pretext of pan-Slavism as opposed to the Greek plan to prosecute a war of protection of the Slavic peoples and the Orthodox populations against the Ottoman Empire, which the British were in no position to seriously morally check, given the amount of va the vast amount of support, which had in fact been supported by Gladstone himself in Britain mm -hmm. and various countries in the West. And we don't really have time to get into it. But from, oh, of course. But from uh, 18... So sorry, mm -hmm. Marcus, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you mentioned, you mentioned Gladstone's government as well. He, the problem, Another thing with him too is that uh, I, I don't know whether uh, where this plays into, say, the Sudanese question, but if it happened afterwards, I mean, the the, the issue with Gordon, Gordon afterwards. Okay, no, I was, was going to say because obviously with the death of Gordon Pasha at Khartoum, that basically destroys Gladstone's government. So they already were already putting out spot fires, and that among their colonial problems, the British hardly had the spare capacity or the public goodwill to venture into another Balkan. Uh, conundrum as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to push back against that, unfortunately. But, 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 yes, I, I agree. But I'm desperate to sort of avoid tangents if that's all right, Marcus. No, um, of course, no, that's because, power because, on. because this is this demonstrates ultimately Disraeli's brilliance, the fact he's able to recapture the situation. But again, yeah. this also demonstrates Alexander II's brilliance because whilst he's expanded Russian influence into Central Asia, he's given up Alaska, which 
with them was actually considered quite profitable to the Americans, which weren't in any way friendly to the British at that point. He has gained further control over Manchuria and direct control of outer Manchuria. Now this is an opportunity to remedy the humiliation of the Crimean War. And riding on the back of the national sentiment and sympathy towards the Balkan peoples, particularly the Bulgarians, from 1877 to 1878, the Russian army uh, wins a string of victories, which puts you in the mind of Suvorov's campaign back in the 1790s and reaches mm -hmm. the outskirts of Constantinople and compels the Russians to sign the Treaty of San Stefano, the effects of which you can see on the left side of this map here. Given the fact that Bulgaria would have operated as a effective Russian vassal state, Russia has been able to circumvent control of the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus by giving Bulgaria access to the Mediterranean Sea yes. and indeed the creation of a larger Bulgarian state. So this is a remarkable about turn in Russian foreign policy, which unlike the previous justification was about preserving the status quo in the Ottoman Empire, which was Nicholas's pretext to keep escalating the conflict, which had been escalated by France and Britain. Mm. What Alexander II is doing is fundamentally revolutionary. And the fact that this is, as we've seen with already the flesh stroke of uh, the Peloponnese and the Attica loss for the Greeks, this is a fundamental shift in the sort of territorial nature of the Ottoman Empire and a significant loss. I mean, it can't be overstated in terms of how um, dramatic this was and would only sort of be reiterated with 1812 and 1813, the Balkan Wars, which almost pushed the Ottomans out of Europe entirely. But seemingly, this was a great Russian victory. However, as with all of these things, this became an international incident because of the seeming, again, grand sort of strides made by Russia to overcome the effects of the Crimean War post-war post situation. And so this is where Disraeli intervenes. Bismarck, again, trying to assume a sort of faint facsimile of what Metternich had been able to introduce after the concert of Europe, was trying to establish Prussia, uh, Prussia, Germany, as the honest broker of the continent. Hence why this summit occurs in, the con uh, occurs in Berlin, because yes. Germany is seen to be a neutral party, albeit, you know, mm. with preference towards Russia owing to, their, mm. uh, owing to their sort of de facto alliance. And it is through the Congress of Berlin that Disraeli is able to reverse the situation, not decisively, but to some degree, with the threat again of another Crimean war equivalently, um, albeit without the unconditional French support, because the French and the British are not allies at this point, and they won't become allies until the early 20th century. But mm. nevertheless, when you look at Disraeli's sort of alteration and limitation of Russian expansionism, and the fact that the Principality of Bulgaria, what existed, Bulgaria was basically split in two. One would be directly administered by the Ottomans, the other would be an independent principality. The uh, so-called Serbia... province of Rumelia. Yes. Serbia was given some territories. Bosnia-Herzegovina mm. was occupied by the Austrians and would be annexed by them 30 years later. Yes. Greece also gained some territories as well and would would majorly gain territories towards the end of the 20th century, towards the end of the 19th century. 19th century yeah. uh, nevertheless, Russia is indicating its ability to expand in a sphere of influence, which they presumably after the Crimean War had been completely cut out of. And what this map also doesn't indicate is that there was a war in the Caucasus going along, um, whereby the Tsar was able to take Cars and the region in the sort of eastern periphery, the Armenian and the Georgian peripheries of the Ottoman Empire, and was able to directly incorporate those territories into the Russian Empire as well. And this caused such a, you can say, if anything, the loss of territory in Anatolia was seen as more sort of decisive in terms of the Turkish sort of national psyche or nationalist psyche that was emerging at the beginning of the 20th century, that Enver Pasha decided to prioritize the restoration of those territories compared to a amelioration of the European situation. So what I really wanted to sort of demonstrate here is the comparison between those two, how this situates within the great game, but also how this demonstrates the fundamental sort of change in the nature of the Russian Empire. No longer is the Russian Empire acting as part of the concert of Europe system. Now Russia is acting as a more aggressive power, pursuing more nationalistic aims in line with what you can say the German nationalists or the Italian nationalists as a byproduct, you can say, or modification of Uvarov's scheme. And by extension, when we see the decline of the Ottoman Empire here, this by sort of logical extension 
begins to involve Russian revisionism regarding the borders of what is now Austria-Hungary. And during the First World War, this revisionism reaches its peak in terms of the support of Czech nationalism, Slovak nationalism, the incorporation of Eastern Galicia into Russian proper, and the support of Croat nationalism and other forms of, again, Yugoslav nationalism and the unification of the South Slav peoples at the same time. And of course, Serb claims decisively against the Austrian Empire as well. So in terms of understanding World War One, especially within that context, and seeing the dramatic diplomatic revolution that's taking place, and Alexander II's attempts to prevent effectively the complete loss of face from the fallout after the Crimean War, the Crimean War I have to emphasize this is why the Crimean War is one of the decisive turning points of European history, because it results in such a dramatic diplomatic realignment. And you can say f f of all the powers, Austria, Prussia, later Germany, Italy, Russia, and indeed Britain itself in terms of recognizing its own imperial role within these events, especially in the Mediterranean theater and as within the context of the great game itself. So really that's the end of my spiel and uh, I'd like to uh, open up the floor to um, any sort of points or really any sort of conclusions or whatever. Um, well, AM, a point I wanted to make is, um, we've not really mentioned it, but by this point, um, Alexander was actually able to um, successfully get the other great powers to allow Russia to remilitarize the Black Sea in 1817. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Because what happens is, is um, when Bismarck sort of defeats France and unites Germany, um, it's sort of in exchange for Russia staying neutral, he sort of pressures them to support um, their goal to have it remilitarized, to have that ally in that moment, essentially. Absolutely. And uh, in terms of just building upon that point, Prussia had remained, as Marcus said, you know, establish a wedge which prevented Austria from you can say escalating its non-belligerence into being a co-belligerent co -belligerent power in the Crimean War. That was the first indication that Prussia alone was prepared to support the Russians. This escalates after 1863, where Prussia definitively doesn't support any revision of the territories within Poland and Lithuania and backs Russia. This is also the same time that Bismarck comes into power. So Bismarck arrives and is responsible for the creation of the German Russian detente. The German Russian detente, again, is, I would say, the fundamental masterstroke of Bismarck in terms of being able to capitalize of Russian opposition and hatred of Western of the Western powers because of the Crimean War. And it's on the tide of, you can say, Russian antipathy towards the West that Bismarck is able to successfully isolate and pick off Austria even Denmark, Russia, and the smaller German states to create the German Empire. So again, by proxy, the Crimean War is responsible for the creation of the German Empire. And the quid pro quo, of course, of the Russian acquiescence to the creation of the German Empire is enabling German support, which now has far more leverage, to facilitate in the remilitarization of the Black Sea. So absolutely, thank you for that point, Hetman. Um, Marcus, is there anything you want to say in conclusion? Uh, uh, no, not really, because I, I think it's probably in the interest of a, in the interest of us both that we end this stream. But one thing that finally came to mind, because I just had a stupid blank when I was talking about um, the charge of the Light Brigade, and uh, I couldn't think of the Fedukan Heights, which is where the artillery was placed. That was that. Um, mm -hmm. That was the only point I could think of. And uh, no, but I, I, it's interesting you have this map up here because I think you're quite right. The, the the deterioration of the Balkan scenario obviously leads to consequences that will reverberate leading into uh, into World War One, and the fact that, like you say, the Ottomans are treated as a major power in the aftermath of the Crimean War, but there's still these fundamental sort of problems, almost like a, a well, we obviously the Ottomans are referred to as a, the sick man of Europe, but there's this, this sort of gradual, almost glacial but terminal erosion and, and corrosion of the Ottoman state that is unabated, um, up to the First World War, and then you see the collapse of the Ottoman state thereafter, in, as an in the aftermath of World War One, and uh, and yes, uh, I guess we'll cover that in future streams. But um, yes, uh, I think we've uh, we've got to a good point to end it. Well, obviously, you know, I I'm interested in Metternich and his diplomatic formula post Napoleon. Yeah. But what fascinates me about this period is that it was possible, and indeed in the interests of both Britain and Russia to maintain the status quo in Turkey. But rather than allow that, the British were 
enabled themselves to be carried away with France <laughs> with the promise of increase influence in the Ottoman Empire. And the result was that Russia had to fall back on pan-Slavism and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire mm. and indeed weakening British influence to claw back that influence and again, yes. aggravate the great game. So I believe fund I fundamentally place responsibility for the Crimean War on Britain and its collusion with France in terms of upsetting this order. Because like I said, after the Greek War of Independence, there was an uneasy peace between the three powers based on the preservation of a new status quo post-Greek mm. independence from yeah. 1832 up until 1853. And albeit Britain was able to achieve a temporary dramatic about turn, um, which favored them, ultimately Britain would now be responsible for an ever ever sort of truncated uh, ebbing and indeed uh, hostile sort of Ottoman Empire to such an extent that Britain would ultimately choose, ironically, to placate the Russians, end the great game and give up the Ottoman Empire to the central powers before the First World War. Mm. Just again, to il illustrate the pure futility, it seems, of the interim between um, the between the Entente between Russia and Britain in 1907 mm. and the declaration of the Crimean War in 1953. But again, just to indicate the knock-on effect that this had, especially Austria's dramatic betrayal of mm. Russia during this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah well, I'm sorry. I, I know I've I basically killed everyone off, so thank you for <laughs> um, bearing with me. But I believe all these points needed to be made. No, um, absolutely. And, and it sets us up for the following stream, of course. <laughs> and and also, given that we've we've previously talked about well, you've certainly previously talked about austria hungary it does frame up those other stream uh, streams as well because this is all important context that sort of you know you really can't talk about one thing without the other you know um understanding the deterioration of the balkans is almost impossible without understanding metanic for example which is something i've come to learn in the last sort of 12 months and talking about this so it, it all interplays with each other anyone who watches these streams will attain that grasp as they as they absorb this information because often it's not taught this way and unless we go down this avenue it's 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 never seen for what it ought to be seen as, as and they're interrelated it's just that simple well thank you for that marcus i'll, I'll take that as a compliment it most um, certainly is it, i mean if you, you you can sort of crash out while i read the super chat so you can stay um i, I do understand actually no to, to to be honest going back to back uh, tonight and last night I, I might bail if that's okay so i wish All everyone right. uh all the best and thank you for watching and thank you am and hitman uh, glad that we could share our streams i know you, you came on for the greek war of independence one so hopefully we'll be we'll share airtime again and um thank you everyone and good night take care right. see you marcus. Good night, marcus see you guys and then there were two <laughs> so um, thank you hitman you've uh, won the endurance contest for this evening <laughs> <laughs> or the last man standing anyway onto the super chats um faith knight for ten dollars thank you very much i hope your vocal cords heal up soon am thank you for the wonderful content as always well perhaps that's a good thing or perhaps it's a bad thing but i haven't seemed to be able to shut up on this stream <laughs> i've gone uh, way beyond uh, what poor columba and poor marcus uh, hope for the stream unfortunately too many points and i i can't shut up so uh, i've been able to speak but um just being on a discussion and being able to rest my voice is really all i need but uh, as you can probably tell i was failing at certain points but um yes hopefully and when it does heal up um i will be back to doing lectures but really this this format is uh, is easier on me i'm afraid for for the time being um john gordon for five dollars uh, how competent were Russian commanders during this period? Well, again, it's in terms of the actual <coughs> military side of this, um, and it's a shame that Marcus is now gone because my focus has always been on, you know, conceptual history and great power relations. Um, in terms of the actual military sphere, my the overall command of the Russian forces was placed under Alexander Menshikov. Not the Alexander Menshikov, who was responsible for the rise of Peter the Great, but a latter Alexander the Menshikov. And he was in many ways indispensable to Alexander II, uh, sorry, Nicholas I, because he was both 
a diplomatic advisor to him and a military advisor, but placed an overall command of the situation in Crimea. He was universally derided for being incompetent. Thereafter, Gorbachev was placed under the um, under sort of supreme command in um, Sevastopol. But maybe Hitman is better qualified to talk about the individual Russian commanders on the ground than I am. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say regarding that super chat? Um, no, well, not really. From the research I made, it didn't really go into the commanders or the individual details of the battle that much. It was just sort of the general course of the war. Uh, the only thing I can say is that, um, you know, I think the Russians didn't... I think the grand strategy wasn't really a problem, because obviously you've got these invading foreign powers on your soil, you want to drive them off. It was just unfortunately, I think they were just outgunned from, you know, it's Britain, France, the Ottomans, and even though Sardinia is not a great power, just the num numerical superiority, I just think won won over in the end, and um, I think a deal of bad luck because um, something we didn't mention was the fact that as well the Allies capture, I think it's Kerch, and um, there there's actually a huge amount of supplies and food for the Russian army, which is lost, so that sort of worsens the logistical situation as well, unfortunately for them. But also another point. I just remembered is that um, we didn't mention that where the conflict in the Caucasus was going on, the Russians do win one significant um, gain at them. I think they take cars from the Turks and the Brits were helping them there too. And so in terms of and one of the stipulations of the peace treaty is the Russians get back Sevastopol, but they have to hand back cars to Turkey. Indeed, and that was something they were able to rectify directly with the subsequent conflict in 1877 and 1878. So again, you can't help but feel that there is an element of revenge baked mm -hmm. into all of Russia's aspirations regarding the Crimean War, and why I believe you have to talk about the second conflict with reference to the Crimea. Crimean War contextualize this, just in terms of the evolution of the aims and the theory of a international conspiracy against Russia, borne out by the Western powers. Um, Bolero, 393 for $5. Uh, the banning of Lady of Shalot today was as devastating as the chat, as the Treaty of Paris was to the Russian Empire. Devastating, friendly fire. I didn't ban her, fortunately. I just timed her out because we've had a, I don't know, a... Oh, well, Yes, a lot of thought bots in the chat. I don't know what it is about my particular chat, which is spawning them. Um, it's very unfortunate, but uh, I, I probably need to empower more mods in the chat so mm. I don't uh, accidentally fire on my own side, <laughs> which happened this evening. Um, anyway, from the aforementioned and temporarily blocked Lady of Shalott, thank you very much, and I hope you can forgive me. Um, Rudyard Kipling wrote the last uh, last of the Light Brigade, 40 years after Tennyson's poem, focusing on the hardships faced by the Crimean uh, veterans in old age. Yes, regarding uh, Rudyard Kipling, I think Panama Hat uh, has indicated even possibly doing a uh, Kipling day. Um, oh. I'm not sure whether that'll sort of take off or anything, but it's, you know, at least been suggested. Um, it was, you know, in response to talk about Kafiristan and uh, you know, Masonic tendencies, which have been, you know, a mainstay in the last couple of uh, lectures. So no, uh, possibly I might uh, revisit uh, Kipling, albeit I'm going to put my hands up and say my knowledge of all sort of higher culture and um, uh, literature and poet, uh, poets is, uh, I would say, of pathetic quality compared to my uh, illustrious uh, colleagues, uh, Panama Hat and uh, indeed Columba. Um, I'm very much a Philistine in that regard. Unfortunately, I only ever tend to utilize things academically, so I don't actually get that much joy out of them. But thank you very much, uh, Lady of Shalott. Now, I think that is the end uh, for the Super Chats. So I am sorry if I have seemed to have dra dragged on quite a lot with this stream, but I, I wanted to make all of these points. Um, so yes, right. Um, as for just general things going forward with the channel, as I mentioned before, uh, lectures aren't going to be happening. On Saturday, on the 3rd of September, Nathan Hood and I are going to be focus are going to revisit the Ardoranye Lord of the Rings series, and we are going to be talking about the rise and fall of Numenor in the Second Age. So uh, I thought there was something quite a uh, poetic about hosting it on the same day that Amazon finally releases its atrocity. Um, <laughs> uh, monstrosity, that would be a lot rather. better. 
so uh, yes, watch that instead of um, Amazon's thing. But uh, at the same time, I, I think it's American time, so it's not going to conflict, unfortunately. So you can probably watch both. But anyway, Ardoranye is back on the 3rd of September, and we will be focusing on the unraveling of the Ottoman Empire, the, the sick man of Europe, which mainly, mainly will focus on uh, Tanzimat and Abdul Hamid II and his attempts to arrest Ottoman decline really after the Congress of Berlin and the Treaty of San Stefano. So tune in for that. Other than that, uh, join the channel, subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like and leave a comment. It helps so much. Thank you so much to the guests who haven't been able to stay to the end, and especially to Hitman, who has made it all the way to the end. So thank you so much, and uh, hope to have you on again. And we've just mm. been, I've just been inundated with more bots in the chat. To, uh, oh, no. They are saying goodbye to me as well. So uh, thank you very much, bots. Um, well, everyone, thank you and goodbye.